good day ladies and gentlemen i am dr hardik gandhi and i represent medical affairs for emerging markets business at zidus it's truly an honor and privilege to be hosting this first ever edition of neurospace and welcome you all to this spectrum of neurosonology a workshop on transcranial doppler organized under the aegis of neurospace neurospace is an academic initiative of zidus with the sole aim to bring together experts in the field of neurology from different parts of the world to facilitate sharing of best practices in this field for this first edition of neurospace we have close to 300 distinguished neurologists as participants and resource persons representing 10 countries across three continents being in its nascent edition it was imperative for neurospace to host a unique topic that piques the interest of the fraternity and while deliberating on the potential topics we agreed that neurosonology exams are indispensable bedside tools for the diagnosis risk stratification peri interventional monitoring and uh, follow up of the patients therefore we engaged with the experts in this field who are also the course coordinators for this workshop and then we developed an agenda which you now see on your screen so as you see on the screen we will first begin with uh, basics and interpretation of waveforms for tcd followed by uh, pfo and emboli monitoring after these two sessions we will be taking up the questions for both of these topics i will request you to post your questions in the chat box available on the left side of your viewing screen this will be followed by a topic on tcd and sickle cell disease and then we conclude with tcd and neuro imaging followed by q and a round again so this will be the sequence of events for today and before we begin let me take a moment to introduce the course coordinators uh, we have with us today dr vijay sharma associate professor yonglu lin school of medicine national university of singapore also senior consultant division of neurology at national university hospital singapore very recently appointed as the senior clinician scientist by the ministry of health singapore dr sharma has published 3, 330 peer reviewed papers and 40 book chapters and is the associate editor for dmc neurology he is on the editorial board of 25 journals including stroke journal of neuroimaging and the journal of stroke among others his current research interests include advanced applications of transcranial doppler in stroke bp management in acute ischemic stroke and intra intracranial stenosis it is a pleasure to have dr sharma with us today also joining him is dr arvin sharma senior consultant in head department of neurology zidus hospitals india and associate professor of neurology at bj medical college and civil hospital ahmedabad india dr arvin sharma has a clinical fellowship in stroke and neurosonology from university of alberta canada and has been trained in cerebral cerebrovascular ultrasonography at national university hospital singapore among the several awards and recognitions that have been bestowed upon him i'd like to highlight one mckinney award which was bestowed by the american society of neurology upon dr arvin sharma in the year 2011 he has several academic affiliations a few of them him being the founder member and treasurer of the society of neurosonology in india executive member of the academy of neuro sonologists of ahmedabad and executive member and treasurer of the indian stroke association in addition to being the member of world stroke organization and the european stroke organization dr arvin sharma has published several papers in national and international peer reviewed journals and truly sir it's a pleasure to have you with us conducting this workshop with that ladies and gentlemen i will now hand over the reins of this session to uh, to dr arvin sharma to discuss the basics of tcd and interpretation of waveforms over to you sir uh thank you hardik thank you very much uh i it's a really pleasure uh, to be here to have a very uh, important topic of uh, neurology and it is of our interest as a course director dr vijay and me 
and when we spoke about this program and we were very excited to compile that uh, for as a demonstration of a different aspect of neurosynology so before as we go on time i'll start my presentation we'll have some demo also as it is a virtual uh, workshop will not able to give the hands on to the uh, all the participants who are here and we found there are a lot of participants from different part of the world so hardik just for the knowledge that you are able to see the slides it's okay uh, yes sir yeah we good yeah thank you so uh, today, uh, the first topic is uh, the transcranial doppler basics and the interpretation of the will form uh, there is no disclosure but uh, when you talk about the basic of any ultrasound you discuss about the few things about the uh, doppler that what is the doppler effect what is the continuous wave form used in the doppler pulse pulse doppler and what the pulse wave is and what the continuous wave is and how you do a doppler right it's 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 a carotid doppler or it's a eco or a transcranial doppler or any doppler so if we go further uh, to go straight how you do a doppler and what probe you use for the doppler for the transcranial doppler you use a 2 megahertz probe and for the duplex which you do which is and i will show you the probe how the probe look like of the transcranial doppler Uh, the duplex which you do which has a linear probe you have 5 to 12 megahertz of the du uh, duplex doppler so it it works on a principle of piezoelectric crystal where it passed on the electric current through this uh, crystal and you can see in the picture that you have different transcranial doppler probes here where there is a intraoperative probe also if you can see the arrow and the next one is this is the carotid probe so those who are starting those want to start the career in the uh, neurosynology it is for them what is the waveform we will discuss about the interpretation of the waveforms also waveform is oscillations per second it's a frequency expressed in hertz so continuous wave output is used in carotid doppler and for the transcranial doppler we use a pulse wave doppler where there is a off and on time and to discuss about it you have to know few of the things that why the pulse wave is important because for the transcranial doppler we are doing through the bone and we'll talk about how the lower the frequency more the penetration of the uh, tissue is uh, pulse echo is a, sing a signal generation only 1% of the entire pulse cycle it's a on time and the off time you can see on the picture where there is a pulse repetition period also and the time of signal return proportional to the distance travel and most important with the pulse wave is the depth discrimination so any doppler any any ultrasound if you take uh, it's it has these three important parameters which are very important frequency resolution and penetration you have to understand that if it is a higher frequency transducer like it's a carotid probe it's a 12 megahertz probe has a very good resolution but you cannot penetrate very deep into the body but as the frequency decreases the penetration is deep in the body if the 3 megahertz is there but resolution will not be as better as what the 12 megahertz doppler is having so attenuation is directly related to the frequency for examination of any doppler instrument if you use a 2 megahertz probe for the tcd first of all most important before saying that you are not able to see anything you have you do a echo you have to find a window right against the bone sometimes you are not able to find a window for even for the eco carotid is very easy sometimes but if it is a high perforation you are not able to see it same it's like for the tcd this area of the temporal area is made translucent as we age it becomes opaque so it is known as uh, as dr vijay always say that it it is known as the stethoscope of the brain so you by that transcranial doppler you can see the temporal area here there are different approaches which is translucent but some of the uh, if you say uh, some of them may have the opaque and as we age it becomes opaque the vessel identified by depth by contour and velocity flow direction and then the, you see the anatomical position so what you do on reading the ultrasound on a screen and identification of the machine settings doppler examination simple and easy component includes the transducer and the sample volume flow direction angle of insonation scale setting and sweep speed so let us go to the demo of the machine if i am able to play this video 
So I'm just go, it's a two minute uh, video, just listen to it. Welcome to the TCD basic workshop. And we are here to demonstrate about the machine about the probe and how we do the transcranial doppler. So this is the probe which we use, which you can see is now, which is 1.5 megahertz to 2 megahertz. And the probe for the carotid doppler is a linear probe, which is from 7.5 megahertz to 15 megahertz. So now we'll go towards the machine. Now on the machine of this transcranial doppler, you see the depth which is 60 here and we can decrease the depth as you can see we've gone to the 55 where the on the M mode you can see the MCA and on the spectral window you can increase the depth and you see that on MCA on the spectral window and above the MCA you see on view which is away from the probe and here you can see the direction of the probe towards which is red for the MCA and away from for the ACA. And on the left hand side, you see the peak systolic velocity, mean dial of systolic velocity, and the PI. And these are all the arteries which we are doing on the transcranial Doppler. That is MCA, ACA, uh, PCA, ICA, and the vertebral artery. So we'll move towards the sonographer to see how we handle the probe. We, we did, did all this with the remote, and now here the probe is handled by the sonographer, Dr. Manta but like a pen like it is handled like a pen and you should be in a comfortable position while doing the sonography you should not be you are leaning too forward it should be comfortable to stand back and there the area that is the transtemporal approach where the anterior posterior and middle it is the tragus where you can put first your probe to see the middle cerebral artery the anterior circulation and at the back foramen magnum uh, you see the uh, vertebral artery and basal artery. Thank you. So hope this may have given some idea about how we do it because it's it's a virtual platform. So we we love when we do a workshop with Dr. Vijay and we do the workshop. Uh, he do all the talking by doing the probe by, by putting the machine. So that is cannot be replaced. That live workshop is a live workshop, but we try to give you some gist of how we do the Dopplers. Now coming to the window for the transcranial Doppler examination, as we were discussing about it, if I put my arrow for the transtemporal approach, this is what the one, two, three I was talking about in the transtemporal area. And this is what the transorbital approach is. And this is what the submandibular approach is, if you can see my arrow. And this is what the transforaminal approach is. And one, two, three are the middle posterior and the interior. By the transtemporal approach window, what arteries you are going to see, if you see this is the circle of Willis, if you see the cut section of that skull, and you see the middle, middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, uh, you see the posterior cerebral artery, and you see the ophthalmic artery, and that is from the ophthalmic window, I'm sorry for that, and the terminal uh, in, internal carotid artery. The transorbital window, which you see here, uh, you see the ophthalmic artery and the ICA at the siphon level. The transforaminal approach, uh, you see the distal vertebral artery and the basilar artery, and the submandibular window is a uh, distal portion of the extracranial ICA. So this is how it looks like. We already uh, showed you with the uh, in the live uh, demo, and you use a continuous two megahertz here. You can see the spectral window and the TCD window here, and this is where the we are focusing from outside uh, for the middle cerebral artery. We use hundred percent power. Uh, the transducer is between the ear and the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. So these are the normal M mode and the Doppler spectra where we see the peak systolic and diastolic RI that is resistant index and the heart rate which you are going to see here. So how you do it? It is very observer dependent. When you first start doing it, it looks like that you never find a window. But as you practice it, it is not more than two minutes you are not able to find the window and then it is all depth dependent. So it is the skull size with matter. When I will take the second talk, I will talk, talk, I will talk about uh, the head circumference. So that will take in the second part, but here you see the de depth direction and the mean flow velocity at the angle, assume angle of zero angle of insulation of the arteries of the circle of the list. So you see M M1 middle cerebral artery at a depth of 45 to 65 and their velocities, the maximum is of the middle cerebral 
uh, is of the middle cerebral artery. Then you see the anterior cerebral artery, A1 and A2 from 62 to 75, 45 to 65. The internal carotid artery is bidirectional. And similarly, the M2, if it is dividing into two, can be bidirectional. Ophthalmic artery, you see at the level of 50 to 62, posterior cerebral artery, 60 to 68. And both the posterior cerebral artery, it is coming up and going down. When you put a probe on the transtemporal area, it looks bidirectional. Basilar artery is always away as you're taking from the uh, foramen, it goes, it, it, as you're putting the probe, you can change the direction, but if you keep the direction towards the probe, it will go away from you. So it will be blue, uh, basilar artery and vertebral artery. And the vertebral artery has the lowest velocity in, if you see all the arteries of the intracranial vessels. And in the children, the velocity is higher, no doubt in that, but we should know when the velocity, when the artery can be bidirectional, you have to know about it. So values are given for the sickle cell disease. We'll talk about in that talk. So if we, I'm sorry, I'm not, yeah. So this is what the circle of Willis on the skull is seen when we have done during our anatomy days. And these are the depth which are given to all the arteries. If you see, if I label one of them, this is the M2 at 40 to 45. And this 55 to 65 is the uh, middle cerebral artery. And on the back side, if you go, you see the, uh, vertebral artery here, and you may see the extracranial vertebral artery even at the lower values of 40 to 45, and the basilar artery goes from 70 to 100. This is very important because when you do, you should know the depth where you are seeing the arteries. And another thing, when we, when we show you, you will listen to the sound. Sound is important for every vessel, like middle cerebral artery has a different sound, internal carotid artery has a different sound, because each artery is a different sound. If in, even, even if you do the carotid, you know about the ECA and ICA. So type of flow is very important. The turbulent flow, you have a turbulent flow in the form of the Reynolds number. If it is greater than 2000 to 2500, it's a turbulent flow. And you should understand, if you see, this is the normal flow which we have in our arteries, that is the laminar flow. And once it gets disturbed, it becomes turbulent because Doppler spectrum represents velocities of all moving particles. So as we have seen the spectral window, we'll discuss more in detail what we see on it. It's the peak systolic and diastolic and mean diastolic, mean flow velocities. And what is the pulsility index and the resistant index? PI is uh, peak systolic when a subtraction from the and diastolic velocity divided by the mean flow velocity. And RI is more, it's same with divided by the peak systolic velocity. So these, these are very important towards and away the power and the insulation and higher up you see the spectral window. So now coming to the part of the talk, as you know about the spectral window, you know about how to do the insulation, where you have to put your probe and how to identify the vessel and how you go further to see the vessel. So vessel identification following five steps and identification of the component of the cardiac cycles are very important. I'll show you in the next figure, but you should uh, know the beginning of the systole, peak velocities during the systole, that is the peak systole, diacrotic notch, which you all know that is very important, that is the closure of the aortic wall signaling the beginning of the diastole, which is absent in if you become hypertensive and as you age. The end diastolic velocity, end diastole, and the shape and the magnitude of the flow deceleration during the cardiac cycle. Now, all the five points I'll demonstrate to you here how to read a waveform. There is on the top left, there is a velocity scale and there is a signal intensity. And as you see the spectral window here, the background is with no noise. But if you see down, there is a noise, right? This is called as a noise. And it is a very good spectral window because you're not showing, I'll talk about the spectral hollowing about it. There is no hollowing and it is a wonderful uh, on a time axis. And here are the PI, that is pulsility index, mean velocity, diastolic and systolic. And this is how you show the probe direction that is towards and away from the transducer. So the first is the beginning of the systole. Then second is the peak systole. Third is the dichrotic notch. And the fourth, this is the end diastolic distance. So one to two is a systolic acceleration. Two to three is a late systolic deceleration. And three to four is a diastolic deceleration. And you should understand that sweep which we are talking about is not like this that you move a probe a lot to see its angle is very minute for the intracranial. You move from M1 to M2 very fast, 
So you have to know that where you are pointing your probe and it is uh, Enion, which is very important when you are facing towards the Enion. So PI, which is the resistance index, as you know that all the arteries are except the ophthalmic artery, which we'll discuss, which is uh, high resistance, all the other arteries are low resistance. So the normal tensive individual, if you see, have a PI between the range of 0.6 to 1.1. About that on the breathing room air, about that it becomes a, um, a high resistant artery. The repulsivity index, as I have told you the formula, it is divided by the mean flow velocities. And it, if you see that it becomes a very high resistant vessel if it is greater than two, because the end diastolic velocities is gone in that. And there are two arteries like ophthalmic artery and when you do the carotid, the external carotid artery, which are the high resistant arteries. So the high resistant flow pattern is seen in the ophthalmic arteries only intracranially I'm talking about. And the high resistant flow can be seen the patient cerebral artery with aging, chronic hypertension, increased cardiac output and during the hyperventilation. There is another RI which is used, that is the resistance to flow can be expressed using the resistance index described by Porcelot. And it is calculated as I told you, the ratio is divided by, not by the mean flow velocity, by the peak systolic velocity. The normal value is from 0 0.75. The controversy as to which index is better to describe the resistance flow in PI, uh, may be more influence and more used by the people who are doing the research by the cardiac output while RI is more reflective of the distal resistance. So we'll go to the cases that how the normal look and how the other diseases can look on the wave, uh, wave interpretation. It's a one, the first case, an asymptomatic 32 year old man with the arterial blood pressure of 130 AT. As you see the waveform, it is a sharp systolic flow acceleration, which is very clear here. And there is a stepwise deceleration with the positive end diastolic flow. The end diastolic velocity falls. This end diastolic velocity falls between 20 to 50 percent of the peak systolic velocity values, and this finding indicates a low resistance of the arterial flow. So, what you see, what you look, that is first is the upstroke, then the peak systolic velocity, end diastolic velocity, end diastolic and peak stella, how much of the end diastolic velocity is occupying the area, and the rhythm. We'll talk about the rhythm in the next further slides. Now that what you have seen a normal in a 32 year old male. Now the second case, you have a 65 year old male with the new onset aphasia, which is having a stroke and a chronic hypertension. So waveform, you can see they are not a very sharp upstroke. There is a rounding off at the top. The waveform above baseline, and there is a rapid systolic upstroke, definitely. It is very straight if you see, it is like a wall, it is not slanting. And the rounded peak systolic complex followed by a stepwise flow deceleration. But if you see the end diastolic velocity is below 30% of the peak systolic value indicating relative increase in the flow resistance. And this increased resistance is because of the chronic hypertension. And normal looking waveform, but having a rounding top, it can be the sign of aging. That is very important. So you can see in irregular heart rhythm on TCD very well. You need may not need the ECG and you can tell a cardiologist that this this subject is having extra systole. But when you see an extra systole, you cannot measure the peak systolic velocity and the pulsility at that time. When there are irregular heart rate, the velocity can be underestimated. You can see it looks like a high resistance here and pulsility can be overestimated in such conditions. So you should wait to pass away that extra systole and take the velocities for the normal vessel, the normal spectrum. So a spectral hollowing, you can see, as you can see back here, there is no hollowing here. And here is clearly there is a hollowing and the broadening of the spectra is seen. And a spectral broadening is a consistent feature due to the large sample volume in, because in relation to the arterial diameter. You can diagnose atrial fibrillation you, on DZD, no need, no, need, no, no need of the ECG there. And you can see how, how the wave, uh, the waveform is very irregular in the form of the peak systolic velocity and diastolic velocity, it is going all haywire. So, so here you can diagnose the AF. In expert hands, things always look easy. So it's practice which makes you perfect. It's if, if from uh, Bangladesh people have joined here, this is one of our favorite person, Gulam is here with us when I was there with Dr. Vijay. So if you see the Spencer curve, 
which is very important for any Doppler and the transcranial Doppler. It is the relationship between the stenosis flow and the velocities. And if you see this, that is the autoregulation which is there in the brain, which maintains the blood flow. And even up to the 90%, 80, 70 to 80 or 90% stenosis, the blood flow is maintained. And then there is, the, there is a drop in the blood flow and the velocity. In that area, the velocity increase high and subsequently the velocities fall down. So we'll go one by one the, where the 30% of the stenosis is, you can see the velocities are good. But as you go for more for the stenosis, more, more, uh, there is a high velocities in the transcranial Doppler. You can uh, see here, this is a very high velocity. Uh, when we'll discuss about the TB, uh, one, two, three, four, five, I'll let you know. And th these are overshooting the uh, spectral window. And then more than 90% stenosis to 100%, you have the dampen velocities, very low velocities because flow becomes very low at that area. So this is how it occurs, stenosis and the flow velocities, 30%, 50%, 70%. Uh, there is a laminar flow on that time, then disturbed flow, and ultimately it becomes a turbulent flow. And you can hear the brew at that time. You can hear the musical murmur. I think Dr. Vijay has that slide. He's going to show you about that. So this is a very important paper about the thrombolysis in the brain ischemia. You have Timmy. You have people using for cerebral angio to show that they have opened the vessel. And we have for transcranial Doppler, that is the thrombolysis and brain ischemia flow grades, predict the clinical severity, urinary recovery, and mortality in the patient. And if you see here, absent is zero. And there is a absent flow signals are defined by lack of regular personality. There is no flow. But you have to see the other side that you are able to identify the vessel or not, or the window is opaque in the transtemporal area. So that is best is to do uh, ophthalmic artery or the other side of the your middle cerebral artery, you can see. Minimal is the only systolic spikes of the variable velocity, no diastolic velocity is there. Blunted and dampened are always confused. So for blunted, it is the flat, flattened systolic flow acceleration of variable duration, variable duration compared to the control. And for dampened, the systolic flow acceleration is completely straight up stroke. And that is a positive anti-diastolic velocity, but it looks like a high resistant vessel in the dampened. But for blunted, the systolic flow is also flattened. That is what is the difference between the damp, blunt, blunted and the dampened is. Stenosis definitely is more than the 30% of the mean flow velocity of the opposite side. And it will be very high velocity, more like if it is MCA, if it is 80, if it is more than 120 of the mean flow velocity, it can't consider to be a stenotic vessel if you are doing intracerebral art, intracranial arteries. And normal, it will be less than the mean flow velocity of the difference compared to the similar waveform. I'll show you a few examples. TB and no flow, I've written very small. So it is very sad. It cannot. It is really very bad for the patient. Minimal, it will look like this. There is only a systolic upstroke. A minimal systolic spikes will be there. Uh, TB2 blunted. Blunted means delayed upstroke, which I told you in those uh, pictures. Um, but these are the pictures uh, which are given by Dr. Vijay. It's a beautiful uh, showing scene in the vessel distal to the stenosis. And TB3 is a dampened, normal looking waveform, but with high uh, resistance, which I spoke to you, and it's seen proximal to the stenosis. And these are the normal looking, but very elevated flow velocities, brood, which we see in sickle cell disease. If the patient is have a tendency of stroke, I'll show you there that how high velocities are there. And those who are with the intracranial stenosis, Dr. Vigel is going to tell you about it. And this is what the TB5 is, which is a normal flow. And I tell you, it's a, it's a beautiful thing which you see if you do a sonothrombolysis for the patient. And if you put a frame there and you are thrombolizing a patient, I have not seen much, but I have seen two or three uh, recovering in front of me and they, they, their, their velocities from the blended going to the stenotic first and then going to the normal. It's a beautifully, you can see the live uh, things happening in front of you. And if you compare it with the um, uh, CTA or the DSA, uh, you see that persistent occlusion to have a sensitivity of 91 to 93% to identify in comparison to DSA for the TB, uh, TB0 to 3. And it is a very good modality to do that. These are the various indications for the transcranial Doppler. Uh, if you see as a basic, it's a long list. You can have a full program of one and a half days, which you do as a national program. So we have taken few topics in, from this. 
which are very important. These are the two papers uh, which we have written with the Dr. Vijay that uh, it's a very good in the annals of Indian Academy of Neurology. You, they are downloadable, they are free. Uh, one is, uh, part one is 2013 one and another one is the transcranial technique and advances which we talk in the first subsequent talks and you can go through these papers uh, and get how we do in different diseases about the transcranial Doppler. And I would like to thank you for uh, listening to the talk and with the patient listening. At this time of challenge, every place of worship are closed, but because of us, place of healing and cure, hospitals are open. Stay safe and stay healthy. I have a second talk, I know that. I'll not say goodbye to you. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my slides. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sharma. We've already received a couple of questions on this, but uh, as we mentioned earlier, we will be taking questions after our next talk. So with that, I would like to invite Dr. Vijay Sharma for his uh, first talk. Uh, sir, may I please request you to deliver your talk on PFO sure. and MRI monitoring. Okay, so, 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 so thank you very much uh, for arranging this. Uh, session of uh, online teaching. Uh, you know, my first talk is a little bit away from what Arvind has just told you. Arvind has formed a basis that how do we do it? And the rest, everything are just applications. So first uh, of all, I will just talk about what is a right to left shunt. Before I talk further, you know, this is further to what Arvind has told. This is a book which just we came out. There was a lack of availability of such a book, uh, which can teach somebody right from the beginning how to hold the probe, where to direct it, where to place the probe, what to see on the screen, how to measure it, and then how to interpret it. So this is not a book which is uh, showing you the literature which is available, it's just showing how do you proceed to perform, and then how do you interpret a TCD which we have done. Uh, this is uh, a book which is available on, on on Amazon. This is the latest book which just came in towards the end of 2019. Unfortunately, uh, this COVID-19 came and it just blocked most of the things which we could have done a manual uh, demonstration publicities. Uh, going further, so let us talk about a right to left shunt first. Uh, when we do TCD, we never try to call it a PFO, although we mean that we are talking about PFO. Uh, we say right to left shunt and then let us see that is it related to stroke or what we call as the mechanism as paradoxical embolism? Uh, so this was described uh, long ago in 15,064 by one Italian anatomist called Botello. And he said that he has discovered on a cadaver, a duct which is connecting the right and the left atrium. And the name which he gave was called as vena arterium nutria. I don't know how to pronounce it in, in Italian, it, you know, definitely it's not what I pronounced, but it was initially called as foramen botello. And later on, people started calling it foramen ovale because of shape. Uh, the problems with PFO are that I'll just explain why it has always remained, uh, you know, a challenging thing that uh, uh, why do we doubt this diagnosis? And why do we want to prove that this PFO is a culprit? The first thing is 25% of normal adults. So if you see on the road 100 people walking, you can just predict that 25 to 30% or even 37% of those adults, they are carrying the PFO. So it's like one in four of us, we are four people sitting in front of you, one of us is definitely having a PFO. Now PFO is a special ingredient when we are not born. Without a PFO, we will not survive in our mother's womb. This is a conduit which is allowing mother's blood which reaches the right atrium in a fetus and then it crosses to the left. So it's a pure blood which is going. So as soon as we are born, nearly 60% of us, we close it with the first breath of our life. But the remaining about 30% people, they carry it. Most of these 30%, they close it by the end of one or one and a half year of life. But then about one fourth of us, we keep it patent throughout the rest of our life. 
whether it will create a problem or not it depends on various factors second you know this is what was seen in an observational study that if you just take stroke patients who are less than 55 years of age and especially those who do not have the traditional vascular risk factors like diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia then nearly half of them they are the people who show a presence of right to left shunt now this is a list of various observational studies which have been published and what you can see is it's a very consistent pattern that most of them for variable odds ratios variable numbers they showed that whether you are doing a trans esophageal echo whether you are doing a trans thoracic echo or whether you are doing a tcd that it's consistently seen that the presence of right to left shunt or pfo is much more higher in those people who are young and also having a stroke and a stroke which is defined as a cryptogenic or stroke of uncertain etiology so i will start with just an example so this is a 22 year old lady who had sudden onset of left sided weakness and she reached hospital very fast just about 2.5 hours from the onset the ct scan which was done which was normal she did not have any risk factor except that she was a smoker she was using birth control pills and in past she had used uh, iv drugs her nihs was 4 upon arrival she was given tpa at 3 hours from symptom onset which resulted into a very good recovery this is the scan which was done on day 2 mri which showed that there was a right subcortical stroke her extensive blood tests for hypercoagulability they were negative routine ultrasound studies both carotids as well as transcranial doppler they were normal but this is the picture which was obtained from her when we did the test for right to left shunt so normal flow what arvind has shown you is this spectrum the lower part upper one is the m mode but this is the spectrum which is showing and what you are seeing in between you are seeing these signals which are high intensity which are brighter in color and they are occurring random some of them they are coming in late systole some are coming in early to mid diastole some are coming in early diastole so they are in different times in the cardiac cycle and they are very bright they are high intensity transient signals or people call them hits or if you want to be more scientific just call them microembolic signals so these were these were obtained when we did a bubble test we had a tee for her we showed that there was a pfo which was present we were chasing what caused the stroke we were trying to join the links the links are that if you say that it is a paradoxical embolism you have to demonstrate that the person developed a deep vein thrombosis but when you take the patient for ultrasound of the legs deep veins it was normal because it was normal by that time we did the ultrasound of the legs the clot had already moved up we were still trying to chase the clot we did the mr venogram of the pelvic veins and you can see many filling defects in the veins so the clot which formed in the deep veins of the leg had moved up it was lying in the deep veins in the pelvis and some fragments of these clots they were going up through the inferior vena cava into the right atrium of the heart and couple of them they just crossed through the presence of a foramen ovale to the left side and then went into the into the systemic circulation one of them it went into the brain and caused a stroke so this is what you need to join these links that a person forms a dvt the thrombus moves reaches the right atrium crosses through the pfo to the left atrium goes to the left ventricle comes out from the aorta and then for some reasons it decides to go into the brain and the reason is very clear that out of your cardiac output nearly 20% of it it goes to the brain although brain is a very small structure in weight but it takes 20% of blood flow every minute so that's why there is a very high chance that it can go into the brain and it cause the stroke how we diagnose it the gold standard is still remains trans esophageal echocardiography which is tee but there are some problems what we face when we do tee you have to pass a big endoscope through the mouth which is not very nicely tolerated despite you know some anesthesia which is created into the back of the throat but still people gag many patients are very anxious they might need a short sedation to do the test 
And once you put an endoscope into the throat, the oropharynx remains open. And for doing any kind of valsalva maneuver, you need to close the oropharynx. So it's very, very difficult for these patients to create a proper valsalva to increase the pressure. Although cardiologists ask the patient to cough, which creates something like valsalva kind of thing. It increases the right atrial pressure and it favors the passage of these micro bubbles, which we inject in towards the left ventricle. On the other hand, when we do TCD, it's a bedside procedure. You can do it in sitting position. You can do it in office practice. There is no sedation required. One person, single person can do it. And you can monitor in real time. This is how the test is done. So before I move this video, I just show you what this shows. This is the right middle cerebral artery, which is being monitored. This is the M mode on the right side. This is the M mode on the left side. This is the left middle cerebral artery. This is the apical four chamber view of 2D echo. What you're seeing, this is the right atrium. This is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. And this was the right ventricle. This is the arm of the patient. There's a cannula in the anticubital vein. It is, it is connected with a triway cannula. So of the three ways, one is going into the vein of the patient and two are going into two syringes. These syringes are filled with 9 ml of saline, 1 ml of air, and a little bit of patient's own blood. And this person is using both hands to shake the blood between the two syringes like this. And this, what you're seeing is a screen which is connected to a manometer. This is a tube of manometer which patient will blow into it. So now I play it and, we, and you see it how this is being done. So this is the shaking which is happening here. This is shaking this is black this is the right atrium from the left atrium. This is the opening of the stomach, injecting the solution. Now you see that the air bubbles have reached the white in color. Then, the, then this person blows air, is looking at the manometer. We're doing the Walsan one now. This is the Walsan one now. And these are the micro bubbles which are reaching from the brain. See, these are reaching here. And you can see these micro bubbles are reaching the left. This is a combined test which is doing ECD, both middle cerebral artery, as well as echo. You can see all these sounds which you are hearing like a bird chirp. They were the micro emboli which we injected. We, when we were shaking it, we were breaking that one ml air into micro bubbles, and patient's own blood it was coating the surface of these micro bubbles so that they survive longer in circulation, and we can detect them in the brain. The total test it just takes about forty seconds. Once you have shaken the blood, you inject, wait for six seconds so that the blood and the micro bubbles which we have created they reach the right atrium. Then you do a valsalva, and after you have completed valsalva, you just monitor for another 22 seconds. So overall length or duration of the test is just about 40 seconds. In 40 seconds, you diagnose a very important condition which was responsible for patient stroke. The contrast mixture, this is the recommended one, 9 ml saline, 1 ml air, and small amount of patient's own blood. But some people, they use even a smaller amount like 2 ml of saline, 0.5 ml of air, 0.5 ml of patient blood. You can do any one of them, but we prefer to use a higher amount of blood, of, of, of saline, so that at least it reaches the right atrium, it's not lost in the population. Uh, this is the study which was just showing why do we mix more, why do we add patient's blood. So this is a very simple test that you shake it, the mixture between the two syringes, and then you take a small drop, put it under microscope, and just count the number of micro bubbles which we have created. So these are the micro bubbles which we created from one ml of air. And then you can create various situations. Six mixes, no blood. Six mixes with blood. Then 18 mixes, no blood. 18 mixes with blood. So 18 mixes with blood. 18 mixes, no blood. And then what you can see is adding of blood, it increases the number of your micro bubbles which you create to nearly 8 to 16 times higher. So you have a higher chance of detecting them. And as I told you that blood, the lipids are coating the surface and they make your test easier because the micro bubbles are reaching for a longer time. This is the old technique which people were using. They were using two different depths because these are the particles which travel. And if they are seen at different times, this was called as an embolic signal. But after 2003, all TCD machines, they are coming with M mode. 
So there is no need to do two death tests. We just do a single death test, which is showing you multiple deaths. So M mode shows you start deaths starting from the, in this machine from about 25 goes to around 90. Some machines are other way around. They start 30 here and they go 90 on this side. And then you have the spectrum also. And you can move this line anywhere from wherever you get, you want to get the samples. The good thing with TCD is that you can do the test in different positions because PFO is something which is affected by body position. The right atrium is having the air bubbles. These air bubbles have to go up. They will go up only when the left atrium is higher. That means the best position should be a right lateral position, not a left lateral position in which trans thoracic echo is done. So that means trans thoracic echo, the position is not conducive for an optimal performance of the test. And what we showed it, that if you do the same person in lying supine position, this is the number of bubbles which you see. Once you turn the patient to right lateral position, you look at it, the number of micro bubbles which you are detecting, it has gone almost like four times higher. Then we ask the person to sit and lean to the right side. That means we are putting now the right atrium below the left atrium. Two, in sitting position, your heart contains blood. When you sit up, the heart is heavy because of blood. It sacks down. The PFO, which was like a tunnel, now it becomes a gap. So it becomes easy for the micro bubbles to cross from the right to the left. But what we found is this in this position, the bending of the shoulder, it prevents some of the micro bubbles going up. So what we found is sitting position probably performs best. Now you can see in the same person, four injections, all four of the gridings are different. So this is because everybody's PFO is in a different shape, is in a different position, is having a different kind of hemodynamic pattern. So in my lab, we do the test in two positions for every single patient, one in supine position and one sitting upright position. And then we say whichever position gives the highest number. The question is which artery do you want to monitor? So the test, if you translate the test into anatomical, you know, just the definition, then this is the venous to arterial shunt. Don't even call it right to left shunt. We are injecting the bubbles into a vein, a major vein, and then we are trying to monitor it in an artery. So you can, since we are talking about stroke, we try to monitor them in one of the cerebral arteries. MCA being the biggest artery, easiest to see. You can do in MCA, you can do in ACA. You can even uh, do uh, it through the ophthalmic artery in siphon. You can even do peripheral arteries. If you don't have a TCD machine, you can put the probe on the carotid artery. You can put the TCD probe on the common femoral artery. What you're seeing is just that there is a passage. There's a communication between the venous side and the arterial side. And the communication is in the interatrial septum. We do not know from TCD that are we seeing a PFO or are we seeing a ASD? Or are we seeing a combination of PFO and, PFO and ASD? So when we report, we say that there is a right to left shunt. And this is where we refer our patients to our cardiologist friends, that we have detected a shunt. You just tell us which shunt is this. Now, we need to count these microembolic signals. We need to count them for grading purposes. So machines are not better in counting than the human eye and ear. So we depend more on what we count. These are the two classification systems which are used in the world. This is called as the international consensus criteria. That means if you count no bubble, it's absent. If you count one to 10 microembolic signals, it's grade one. 11 to 20 is grade two, more than 20. If it comes in a shower pattern or it comes in a curtain pattern. So just remember we, we mostly we do not count grade zero to two as clinically significant. Those people who do research purposes, they do more intensive counting of the micro bubbles. So intensive counting is same. Zero means no micro bubble signal was detected. Grade one means you are detecting now one to 10 micro bubbles throughout the test. Grade two means 11 to 30. And then grade three means 31. And then it goes up like this. So what I've highlighted is if the shunt is grade three, whether in the consensus criteria or whether in the Spencer scale criteria, both of them are considered clinically significant. Significant means that these are the shunts when we refer the patient for a TEE or a TTE, we know it probably will be positive. 
Now this is one patient with a high grade shunt. just seeing that was a curtain appearance so that's a very high grade shot for clinicians we use a rope score called risk of paradoxical embolism called rope score it's a very simple score just to identify which patient you feel more confident in referring to the cardiologist for favoring a closure of it that very simple no history of hypertension no history of diabetes no history of stroke on tia non smoker and you so all of them no 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 they score one point each if there's a cortical infarct which you're seeing because most of these emboli which come from heart they tend to go to the periphery it, so periphery means in the cortical regions all of them score one 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 age younger the age higher the score so 18 to 29 30 to 39 5 4 3 2 1 0 and then you total them how much a score and then you say fine that how much do you score? So our patient, you saw it, just 20 years of age. So it scores five from the age only. And she did not have hypertension, did not have diabetes, did not have a previous stroke or TIA. But she, is a, she was a smoker and it was not a cortical stroke. So she scored one, two, three and five. Her score was eight. This shows that this is what is seen in observational studies, that higher the score on the rope criteria, if you have a higher score, like our patient was score of eight, that means there is a 67% chance that there will be a PFO. And what is your predictive value that this PFO was the mechanism for the stroke in this patient? You can be confident to a 84%. So that means you have very high level of confidence in saying that the stroke has occurred in my patient because of paradoxical embolism. Then the second part of the talk, I'll just talk about the closure. It has remained a controversial thing because the first clinical trials which came in 2011, 12, 13. Now these trials were three, closure one, respect and PC trials. They did not show that there was a benefit in closing these PFOs. But if you see these trials carefully, there was a trend. There was a trend that no, there is something hidden behind the, you know, the whole data which we see. There is a possibility that PFO closure was probably beneficial for patients. So that was the first trial, RESPECT trial. And RESPECT trial was, is, you know, we have such a long follow up for this trial. It started from 2003 and we have the data until 2017. 14 years of data which we have. This is where they published the first paper, the primary endpoint analysis. You can see the P value as 0.08. This p-value is a continuum. We fix 0 0.05. So it is just showing that probably there was something there, either the number of patients could have been more, or the patients could have been of different type, or we could have waited a little bit more, this p-value could have gone into favor. But because this was the intention to treat analysis, that means everybody was included in the analysis, whosoever participated. But when this the same thing was done in per protocol analysis, so there was a positive response that it should have been done. So this trial, what happened was instead of just putting the data in a fridge or in a, in a cabinet, they continued to follow up these patients. And this is where they did the final analysis of an extended follow-up of these patients. And then they presented the results. Even in the intention to treat analysis, there was a 45% relative risk reduction and which was statistically significant for reducing strokes in cryptogenic stroke patients. So these are the new three clinical trials that respect extended study, reduce and close. All studies, they are almost having a similar pattern of recruitment that all are less than 60 years of age, no AF in these patients, not many risk factors, except that this one used large shunt as well as atrial septal aneurysm, presence of atrial septal aneurysm or echo as one of the including criteria. So this is one of the longest trials which I showed you just now. 5,800 patient years of follow-up 
nearly 5.9 years of average follow for the patient. And it was quite a large trial, 980 patients, 69 centers. This is exactly what I showed you about the RESPECT trial. There were some patients, you know, who received warfarin. There were some patients who received clopidogrel plus aspirin. There were some patients who received a combination of aspirin per diaparidamol. Some were the only aspirin alone. So there were many type of patients which was, you know, many type of antithrombotic agents which were used by these patients in both groups, both in the medical management as well as the device closure. But this is what was seen in, seen in the intervention, intervention tree. You can see it. It's a 62% risk reduction if you close in favor of closing the PFO, which was much, much better actually. And you think like this, we are talking about patients in a younger age. We are not talking about patients in the usual stroke age of 65 or 70 years. We are talking in young patients who are in their productive age group, working. And then they were looking at whether there are some other characteristics of PFO which play a role like presence of atrial septal embryosum, which is more than 10 millimeters of excursion of the septum or there were large shunts which were seen on the echo. The RESPECT trial, it was a big benefit actually when the shunt was substantial, when there was an atrial septal aneurysm. That 62%, it went up to 80% rate of restriction. That means high risk PFOs, they provide much better protection if you close these PFOs. Overall, there was a significant reduction in the risk of ischemic stroke, there was significant reduction in those cryptogenic strokes. And even if you remove the age part, even then this was a significant relative risk reduction for stroke in this, uh, in this trial. It was a highly successful trial for the technical part and even for the procedural part. So both of them, they were in high 90s. So it was done very meticulously. It was easy to deploy the device into the heart. And if you look at, you know, the, 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 all the adverse events which happened in, this, in these patients, they were very small in number. You look at this, out of 980, they are mostly in single digits. They are not in double digits. And they were comparable. They were more actually in the medical management group as compared to mostly here. There was an atrial fibrillation, which was a concern initially, that somebody who is, say, 50 years of age having a PFO, the heart is living with a certain kind of hemodynamics and one go in one second, you close the PFO, the heart thinks that something has gone wrong. So atrial fibrillation can occur in these patients at that time. So this was initially thought to be something which was not encouraging because once somebody develops atrial fibrillation, you say it was a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, you tend to put these patients for lifelong anticoagulation, but then it was seen that Although the atrial fibrillations which occur in patients due to closure of PFO, these are transient AF. These are not qualifying for paroxysmal AF. They are transient and usually within a month, they disappear. Very few patients, if you look on this side, very few patients develop SAs. They are all in single digits, one, one or two, two. Total about 2.44%, it's okay. But they were all in a very, very small number of patients, total 12 the serious adverse event. And I told you about atrial fibrillation, there was no difference in the risk of developing atrial fibrillation, which will require a long-term anticoagulation. So there were no concerns. Now that was not the only trial which was positive. Simultaneously at the same period, two more trials came out. And these trials, one was reduced. The reduced clinical trial, almost same kind of mechanism, but it was using, instead of Amplitzer device, which was used in the respect, it was using the Gore Cardioform device and the Helix device. But the results were saying that there was a huge benefit in terms of risk reduction. You can see it, this comes to around 77% relative risk reduction for these patients in favor of closing the PFO. Same thing was observed in the closed trial. Again, same kind of inclusion criteria and same kind of response. A very high so you look at it, it's nearly, it's more than actually 90%, something like, uh, you know, uh, favor in favor of this one. Most of these trials were done on Caucasian populations. Uh, there were no Asian trial except this small South Korean trial, which was called as defense PFO trial. It was not a big trial in terms of number of patients, but only 120 patients were there, but it showed 100% protection 
without any additional risk for, to the patients. So highly successful trial. So that's the Asian data which we have. Putting all together, if you put respect, reduce and close, don't include even the defense trial, which was a smaller trial, all trials speak the same language, that there is an evidence in favor of closing PFO, in favor of early closing and prevent your patient from both recurrent strokes as well as hemorrhagic complications which are associated with the use of antithrombotic medication. Because what you do is most of the patients, they are kept on double antiplatelets for first couple of months, followed by single antiplatelet agent for up to six months. And then most of the patients, they go off antiplatelet therapy. So that means all the bleeding complications associated with antithrombotic medication, they are gone away from the patient. Your patient who was 30 years of age, does not require to take any kind of antithrombotic medication for the rest of 70 years of life, he will be free of all medications and medication-related side effects. So this was the editorial which came in the New England Journal that probably we have reached the time when PFO with a sizable intraatrial shunting should be closed. Uh, for Asia-Pacific, this is a very recent paper which has just come out in the Journal of Stroke. We wrote about it, that what are the consensus statements for Asia-Pacific region. Probably in your region, you can do the same thing, that just form a consensus group and just come out with the consensus guidelines that how to translate the data which is available to your population and just give some kind of recommendations, not only to the general physicians, but to, to, to general neurologists, to stroke neurologists, that how to handle the presence of a right to left shunt in your population. So in this publication, this is all from this, the same publication, we came out with the symbols of red light, traffic lights, that if the light is green, you can go safely, you should do it. If the light is orange, yellow, then you should be careful, but you can still do it. You should be just careful. But if it is red in color, don't do it at all. And there were a lot of unanswered questions which the trials have not answered. Uh, so we came out with this PFO closure in any patient, you know, who is more than 60 years of age. We say, no, it was not addressed in the clinical trials. We do not do, know, know about it. But all others, like all those patients who have a rope score, which I just showed you more than six or six or more, yeah, you should close it. There is no reason why you should not close it. But if you have somebody who requires an indefinite oral anticoagulant, say somebody with protein C deficiency, then you say, anyway, I'm supposed to give him anticoagulation for the rest of life, then there's no advantage actually of closing the PFO because in one of the clinical trials was found that there is some benefit which is seen in favor of rivaroxaban. So you will not close in this one. So same like this, we had this meeting for two days, uh, which included uh, stroke neurologists and cardiologists from across the Asia Pacific region. And then we came out with this, that fine, when you should do it, the timing, that do it as fast as you can. Why are you waiting for the second event to happen in this patient? Just do it as soon as you diagnose it. There's no, because there's no preparation to do it. You're not, these are young patients. They don't need extensive workup for anesthesia clearance or because they are not done in, 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 in patients who are anesthetized. They are done in patients who are awake. At the most, they are having a very short sedation. Uh, so uh, you, sh you should do them as fast as you can. Uh, whether you want to give them aspirin or you want to give them clopidogrel, uh, whether you want to give them warfarin, no, there's no indication that to give them warfarin, uh, there is no reason that if, you know, even in those patients where you decide that, no, I'm not going to close it, or the patient says, I don't want to get it closed, then there is no indication why you should be giving warfarin. But because of one trial which used uh, the, the newer anticoagulants, probably there may be a place to do it. Uh, so I will just say that they, this is a known mechanism that paradoxical embolism happens, especially if the person is having, in addition to, to, to a PFO, atrial septal aneurysm and a large shunt, then it should be closed. I'll spend just last couple of uh, minutes, just few slides about the embolic signals. So embolic signals, this is what we were looking at embolic signals. They are called either HITS, high intensity transients, or you call them microembolic signals. So I told you high intensity transient. On this spectrum you know, of the flow, which is seen, on this side, you can see this, this line of colors, this shows the intensity. The flow in this patient is in this intensity. 
little bit bluish toward the greenish color. Any color which is above it is having a higher intensity, at least three decibels higher. So you see all of them are in this range while the flow is in this range. So that means these are high intensity because they are occurring for a very short fraction of time because this line is showing you the time axis. This is six seconds. So you can see it, this is taking microseconds only. So they are transient and they are of high intensity. They, have, they are called as high intensity because the intensity is more than the background blood flow. They are unidirectional. Either they are towards the probe or they are away from the probe. This is a signal from a bifurcation. There are two arteries, one towards the probe, one away from the probe. They are unidirectional. Not only unidirectional, they are random in cardiac cycle. As I told you, this is somewhere in mid, mid to late systole. This is a late systole. This is a late diastole. This is occurring in again early systole. Mid systole, very early systole, late systole. So they are all occurring randomly. They are not occurring in a fixed time. And then the sound is, I showed you one, the sound is like a bird chirp, like this. It can be a short moaning sound. It can be a short whistle, you know, whistling sound. These are the three sounds which have been described by American Heart Association to diagnose a microembolic signal. And the last one is that they travel in time because they are solid particles. So they will consume time. So if you look at most of them, they are tilted. They are not straight. They are tilted either to this side or to this side. See, all of them, they have a little bit of tilt. That means they are spending time at the, as they are traveling in the blood circulation. And you can hear this sound, the one which I told you, the bird chirp. You know, it's so loud. You'll be able to hear this sound. But when you are doing TCD and you are seeing these, these microembolic signal one, two in the siphon on the, on the left side, when you go to MCA, ACA, you see the same signal here. And then when you were doing the other side, again, you see this one at different depths. If you see everywhere like this, a small, small, small microembolic signal, then you say it is highly unlikely that so many microembolic signals are coming from an organic lesion. So commonest cause of this one is metallic heart valves. Because when the blood strikes against the metallic heart valve, a froth kind of thing forms. And this froth, it goes up into the brain and this is detected as microembolic signal. So never be alerted for it and don't do anything to it. Now, these are few videos which are available, you know, which have been published in New England Journal of Medicine, Internal Journal of Cardiology, Cardiac and Cardiology and Cardiovascular Medicine, where you can see the true PFO and you can see a blood clot which is half is lying in the right atrium, half is lying in the left atrium, right? So this is, you are lucky that you did an echo at the same time when the thrombus was sitting, it was transiting through the right to towards the left atrium. But this is something which is not commonly seen because by the time you do these tests, the thrombus has already disintegrated. It has already reached where it was supposed to be there and has already caused the damage. So this is not always seen. Sometimes it's seen as an evidence that yes, there was a thrombus in transit. I saw it. So that means the mechanism of paradoxical embolism can be proven. Uh, probably if COVID-19 disappears, we will try to do a live hands-on workshop where you can see all these things being done. How simple are they? Uh, and how simple to, to perform them? How simple to interpret them? How to use in your clinical practice? For the time being, let us pray together what Arvind told, keep our hospitals open and let COVID-19 disappear as quickly as possible and we resume a normal life. Uh, with all good wishes, I will end here and we'll see whether there are any questions which we want to take. Over to you, Hardik. Thank you, sir. Thank you for taking the audience through this presentation and highlighting some landmark trials on uh, PFO closure as well. Uh, sir, uh, we do have some questions and uh, I would like to first of all request Dr. Arvind to uh, take them because uh, I believe they are for his presentation. Uh, Dr. Arvind, uh, the first question that we come across and uh, you know, uh, in his opening talk, Dr. Vijay Sharma also highlighted about it. Uh, the question is very, very, very basic. Does handling of the probe, the TCD probe, affect the waveforms and 
the the question is does it handling like a pen or whether you handle it like a torch does it make a difference in terms of uh, the wave forms that you see on the screen very very good question it's very very good question uh, so the thing is the handling of the when i told you that you handle it like a pen so it is the most a uh, comfortable position to grip that right and to keep at a position for a longer time right so when you hold it at a pen and you put it on the transtemporal area you can hold it more and it is more stable there so the thing is it will affect a waveform because if you lose the signal as you move your probe you will move lose the lose the signal for that vessel and if it is going up and down also you will lose the signal you will go from mca to aca so you are not able to identify the disease that what you are looking for so that is the first thing so the probe position and to fix it is very important not only the probe which how you handle it it is how you keep it and what your position is of your hand is if it is in the air you are not like a he man or like this that you were able to hold it in that area right so you should have some support i told you that the comfortable position where your hand can be put and you can hand you can handle that probe for a longer for 15 minutes and you can hold that probe at that right position so handling of probe is very important it is not necessary that you always handle it as a pen i have seen people handling the probe from the back and then doing wonderful right but the ideal thing is to hold it like a pen so i will i will i will just add a couple things to of things here yes, sure sir so one of them is you know just if you hold like uh say a knife or a torch uh you know this position is the one which is like you know holding a screw driver and as a neurologist you know mechanics they develop carpal tunnel syndrome the tcd people they never develop carpal tunnel syndrome because you are holding those people who are writing who are writers type writing is a different thing but writing is never associated with carpal tunnel syndrome the second part is when you are holding it like a pen the important thing is you have you are not doing a test on a demo you are doing a test on a live patient patient is moving around and you don't want to lose, lose signals when you are doing a tcd basically you are navigating in the same artery or from one artery to another artery say from mca you are going towards the aca or from mca you are going towards the pca when you are navigating you want to have your hand fixed on patient's head so once you are holding it like a pen you can have your hand on patient's head so if my hand head moves now my hand is also relaxed moving with him so i'm not i'm never losing the signal so not only holding like a pen but holding it like you are keeping your hand supported on patient's head in such a way let the patient move you cannot hold his head tight you can ask your you know helper to hold the head tight i'm going to do a tcd because it's not like one point you Absolutely. are basically something like you know we always give an example that if you people have seen you know venice in italy so it's the multiple rivers so you think like this somebody leaves you with a boat in your mca and tells you navigate yourself from the mca river into the distal mca river go to the aca river and then navigate it to the pca river so if you lose signals in between then you lose the whole track because it's a relationship between the two arteries you are moving from one to another <coughs> you never do the test in isolation that now i am doing the mca then you remove the probe then you say now i am going to do the pca no this is not the method you do in one go that i was seeing mca and my pca is in posterior relation to the mca so because i am navigating so i want to hold it as lightly as possible and not tiring my hand when i'm doing it thank you sir and thank you for the beautiful analogy about venice uh, uh, <laughs> hope it's <go> there again <laughs> <laughs> hope that happens soon uh, sir uh, an another question i i believe is uh, from an academic angle is that which index is preferred while using the tcd is it the pulsatile index or the resistance index you you dr arvind sharma you showed yeah uh, in a slide that there is some controversy in using this uh, indices it's very simple both indexes are important but ri definitely is a more accurate index it is no doubt in that but as the all the neurosynologists they have used more a pi 
so the pi is used and both can be calculated so so if you see in all the machine the pi is mentioned not the ri is mentioned in that you know the 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 just to add, to add it uh, again you know this is like a bias if you ask scientifically so i always feel that ri is a better indicator because this takes into account the whole circulation starting from your heart to the distal circulation from the point where you are doing it uh pi mostly mostly represents what's happening after it after you know where you are doing it so you are seeing the downstream cerebral hemodynamics but what has happened is when people started using it most people used pi and all the publications they continued to follow the pi so pi became famous and ri was forgotten but i can tell you when we write papers which are mostly depending on the resistance in the flow like when you are doing a tcd to look for say predicting icp or monitoring icp in those cases it has been invariably the reviewer has asked kindly provide me ri figures also so if the paper goes to somebody who is trained in neurosonology he may ask you to provide ri figures also but you know traditionally the number of uh, you know the publications which have used pi it is probably 100 times or maybe even 1000 times more than what people have used ri and even when people have used ri even in my own publications wherever ri came it came along with pi some machines show both but most of the time these you know what you see on the screen it can be it can be adjusted by the operator so most people they do not want to see ri at all because their eyes are tuned they are trained to, to look yeah so but yeah i totally agree ri is a better indicator but since we go with the flow we go with the traditions so traditionally pi has been used so just keep using whichever you want i prefer to use both actually thank you thank you sir uh sir uh, the next question is for dr vijay sharma uh, specifically asked by dr shafiq dexter abuzaki uh from the philippines uh the question is is there an increased risk of hypercoagulability in patients with pfo versus the normal population because patients with pfo may present with strokes but those without do not always present with vascular obstructions of the other organs okay so you know this is a very observational thing that uh, people what people say is this that pfo is present but why pfo causes a stroke so when we say about it so that means what what i told you before that it's joining the link so first link is causing a dvd so you say there has to be a, some kind of hypercoagulability whether this was because of prolonged sitting in the air in the in the in the plane for a long flight or it was some kind of hypercoagulable disease like protein c or protein s deficiency or anti thrombin 3 c deficiency or you have got sle you have got anti phospholipid syndrome so because in this population you try to investigate patients more for hypercoagulable stuff so that that means you are biased towards finding it but traditionally we know it that our pickup rate for a definite hyperthrombotic or uh, hypercoagulable state is just about 1% in only 1% people we are able to find it so we clearly say although it's very very clear pfo is considered to be a disease which is associated with some kind of endothelial dysfunction but there is no direct relationship that if you have a pfo you also have a thrombophilic state no it's not true thrombophilic state is separate but if somebody is having both then he is at the worst stage because because of the thrombophilic state because thrombophilic state means you are going to develop venous thrombosis so you will have a venous thrombosis and then you have a pathway from where the venous side clots they can cross go to the arterial side so that's the worst combination a thrombophilic state as well as presence of a pfo or a asd or anything which is connecting the two uh, sides of circulation otherwise pfo has nothing to do no relationship with thrombophilic state thank you sir uh, so going to the next question is by dr jezel samonte uh, the question is again on the waveforms uh, would you recommend a minimum number of waveforms for analysis uh, 
we are talking about the waveforms that is uh, it's talking about the number of waveforms so it is very important that we go meticulously uh, to see all the waveforms in the form of arteries right so if you are seeing the middle cerebral artery anterior cerebral artery it is not that the only one artery you analyze the whole brain so you need to see all the arteries uh, for the waveform and how the waveforms are for all the arteries sometimes you may find a uh, most of the stroke are in the mca so you look for the stenosis there or any abnormality there but you can find it in anterior cerebral artery sometimes they are donor arteries where you find a there is obstruction at one place and the other artery is giving a more flow to it so it's a hemodynamic thing so every waveform is important uh, to look for if it is uh, posterior circulation or anterior circulation and waveform varies as we told you how the normal waveform looks and how the other type of waveforms are which are abnormal so even the different arteries have gives if one artery is showing something and other arteries can help you to make the diagnosis so it is very important to do the all the arteries to uh, give the diagnosis so again you know i will just add something to it uh, so so addition is this that see all of us we have signatures so same is our all arteries they have got signatures so if you ask me to sign five times my five signatures may be a little bit different and one of them will be totally totally different the screen provides you the screen that means one screen one screenshot so most of the machines they are starting from 4 to 6 seconds so this is what one screen counts so on one screen you want to see the maximum waveform they are of the similar shape of similar so that gives you an idea fine whatever measurements i am doing these measurements are correct but if the measure if the is the wave forms the signatures are totally different the all four or all six wave forms are different then you want to have some more because there are two kinds of numbers for peak systolic velocity and end diastolic velocity that come out one type is the machine gives you the number that means you have put the envelope on your trace and machine gives you this is the peak systolic velocity this is the end diastolic velocity and then calculates pi and ri for you on the other hand if it's the af then machine is unable to whatever number machine gives it is not it's not reliable so then you do a manual calculation for manual calculation is very clear you want to have consistent waveforms and consistent waveforms if your hand is not moving around you will definitely obtain a consistent set of waveforms on one screen and that is okay but those which are minor variations they occur because your hand is moving patient head is moving uh you know so so you just try to find out what which are the three wave forms which look similar then i say fine this is the signature of mca in this patient which is representative sign of mca and then whenever you are moving from mca to the distal mca or you are moving from mca to aca or you are moving from mca to pca just remember it that mca looks like this if the distal mca looks totally different then something has happened in between the two so that's why remembering that what the waveform was is important so you don't want to move very fast that if four you know signatures which i saw for mca were they were di different so when i go to the distal mca i don't know which was the correct signature so that's why we want to maintain a good sample that means one screen should be there where i can remember that this is what the mca looks like and i will be seeing the rest of the arteries in reference to this signature that if the signature is different then the different artery so this is how we so, so that's the minimum number which you need there is no minimum number that you have to record everything for 10 seconds or you have to record everything for 8 seconds it's not like that one screen is enough actually if 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 it's a reliable and it's stable uh, signal which you are seeing so so that uh, i mean before we move to the next question that leads me to ask that for experienced hands like yours both of yours typically how how much uh, does this test take i mean i am talking in terms of time very good question so and i will tell you the difference uh, me and dr vijay also it makes a difference right even you tell me both experts i am doing from uh, 10 years or 12 years dr vijay is doing from last 20 25 years so experience make a difference dr vijay see when i do a tcda sometimes i don't find a vessel he just put his hand on the probe and he find the vessel 
right? I'm, I'm putting an angle and you just touch the probe and get that signal so beautifully. So it makes a difference who is doing it and how many years you have. Just like my sonographer, Dr. Mamta is there. I just moved a probe, I got the MCA. So it depends on that who is doing it. If Dr. Vijay is doing it, it takes sometimes two to five minutes. If he's not finding the vessels, I'm taking on part of Dr. Vijay, this question that if he's not finding the vessels, he will not find the vessel because of it is opaque, right? If it is not opaque, he's going to find the vessel. So it, if it is a difficult case, maximum 10 minutes. And if it is a smooth case, he will find it in a minute, not more than that to complete the test. Maximum two minutes, right? But those who are for the monitoring purposes, then you have to put the frame that all together 10 minutes, but Dr. Vijay will add to it and tell you about it. So it's like this that you know this is a rule in in the in the in the world, you know, the 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 log distribution. The log distribution says that everything falls uh, in, in 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 same log distribution, normal distribution. Normal distribution means that uh, 97.5 people, you know, percent people will be in this range. So that range is like this. When you are doing for the first time, uh, you may spend one hour. And after one hour, you will come out that I did so many things, but I don't know what I did. So that's a normal response for everyone. Uh, for those who are, so I can tell you because I train a lot of people, those who are neurologists, because they, their, their, their mind is having an imprint of circle of Willis, the location and the orientation. A neurologist spends one week with me, uh, so in my center, then he goes back and then I tell him that you do only one test per day, not more than one test per day and spend probably like 25 or 30 minutes on one test. And then by the end of four to six weeks, you will be almost what I have been doing for 20 years. So that means you will start doing the test in about 15 minutes time. And you will come out with the answer during that time. The test is not like this, that you spend 20 minutes on doing the test and then you see all the numbers and then you interpret. The test is like this. When you are doing the test, you are simultaneously interpreting the test. So on an average, a complete TCD in those people who have got decent windows on the transtemporal, a TCD takes about 20 minutes maximum, 20 to 25 minutes maximum. This is this is something which is relevant for everyone. We call it an operator dependent test. But my definition for operator dependent is those who are good operators will over, always do a good test. And every neurologist can become a good operator. You can fall into that 97.5% the log distribution. 2.5% uh, people, you know, not everybody is having a technical hand. Many people, they are unable to hold the hand properly. This is inherent in them. This is a very small proportion, just about two to 3% people. So they will keep on struggling for the rest of their life. But my experience is I don't have even a single failure so far. Everybody who learned was able to do it. It's just generating interest in you. Interest in the way that stroke is vascular disease. It's a vascular neurology. It's about blood flow. There is no test which provides you information in real time about blood flow. So if you're dealing with a stroke patient, you should be interested in knowing the blood flow. And if you're interested in knowing blood flow, this is the best test to do. It's a bedside test, 15 minutes. And if you know about the patient that you are seeing a patient with right MCA stroke. So even if you are a very busy practitioner, you don't want to spend time, just put the probe on the right MCA, right ACA, that's all. You know everything that what is happening to your patient. And whenever you have time, or you can ask your technician to complete the test later on. So you don't need to really spend much time on this test. It's a very fast learning curve. For technicians, the life is different. Because technicians are not trained to know about circle of Willis. It takes them nearly one month to understand what is this circle. But uh, the, the neurologists take about one month to become proficient in doing it. Technicians, they need about two to three months. They will become very good because they do more than one test every day when they are learning. So they also learn in one month, but to understand anything, they take three, four months minimum. Uh, those who are interested in learning more, those who are not interested, they become wonderful technicians. They will give you beautiful waveforms, but they have no idea what they are giving to you. So technician's life is different. And doctor's life, I told you, this is one week you dedicated training. And after one week, one test, that means half an hour, Monday to Friday. 
And you can even do like three days in a week. Don't worry about doing every day. And after one month, you are a trained person to talk about it. Thank you, sir. So the next question is <clears throat> by Dr. Hazel Barroso. Uh, in the hits, uh, will a shower or a curtain cause a larger stroke than those with lesser microembolic signals? Uh, you know, shower or curtain, they just show what is the embolic potential of the PFO. That Shower just means that this is a large PFO. When I say large, I'm not saying large in terms of anatomical considerations. I'm talking that the location, the shape of the shunt, because I told you the PFO is like a tunnel, right? So in, pe in some people, it's a long tunnel, so bubbles can not cross very easily. But in some people, this is a gap in the, in the septum. Then they can cross more. It's the anatomical location. Uh, the more number of uh, uh, micro bubbles you see, the more the chances that a clot which forms on the venous side, it will have a higher chance. Unfortunately, all the clinical trials which were done in all of them, either TCD was not used or TCD was just used as a screening tool. And then the, you know, because the definitive diagnosis comes from echo. If the echo does not see it, then they cannot close it also. So numbers which we have, one of the trials, which are you know, the, the closed trial, which I showed you, that used presence of a large shunt. So large shunt, they said, in terms of size, the excursion of the atrial septal aneurysm, as well as larger number of bubbles in the left side. So it translates equally. If the shunt is very conducive for transmission of these micro bubbles, this is associated with higher numbers. And the higher number of bubbles which we see, this is having a higher potential. So on TCD, you can just say like this, higher number of bubbles gives you a higher chance that our cardiologist friends, they will also pick it up on their echo. And this is a shunt which is much more conducive for closure. So this is from where it comes. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, and just one last question before we move on to the next. And I'm not sure about this question if we may be digressing a little bit, but... Uh, Dr. Jeff uh, Rosario uh, wants to know how can you identify uh, PFO versus ASD? Okay, on TCD, there is no way. There is no way to differentiate PFO from ASD. Because there are some patients who have got a combination of PFO and ASD. TCD just detects that this is a right to left shunt. In terms of clinical management, it's very, very clear. The moment cardiologist diagnoses uh, ASD, because one of the, either ASD is diagnosed right at the time of birth by the neonatologist, or it is diagnosed in late 30s. So these are two ages. And the late 30s is the age when we get young strokes. So the, the, the current recommendations are the moment you diagnose ASD, you do not need to look for the evidence. You have to close it. There is no way you can leave it alone. For PFO, there is a consideration that you can talk to the patient that there is a passage and there is a possibility that now we can safely close this one. So the, the differentiation between the ASD and PFO is on echo. On TCD, both look same. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Sharma and Dr. Arvind Sharma for this uh, wonderful question. We have more questions coming in, but uh, in the interest of our agenda, let us now move on to the next talk by Dr. Arvind Sharma on TCD and sickle cell disease. Over to you, Dr. Arvind Sharma. <clears throat> Thank you, Ardik. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are on the second two sessions to go. And we proceed to our talk. I think you can see the slides. It's all okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you are able to see the slides. So. So about this talk, uh, as we were talking about the indications of the transcranial Doppler, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, ambulatory monitoring, PFO, which is taken by Dr. Vijay. And then we talk about vasospasm, vasomotor reactivity. We talk about, uh, I told you all the indication, even the TIA for ambulatory monitoring, then circulate uh, brain brain dead patients, you can identify those. You can do sonothrombolysis. 
there are many indications and one of the indication which is not related to stroke is sickle cell disease but indirectly it is related to related to the stroke as sickle cell disease is very common that those people those children suffer a stroke it is a very unique indication and it is the only indication where tcd can make uh, the diagnosis and can help and it is effective prognostically to treat the patient and if you identify those who can suffer the stroke and you can prevent the stroke in those children so it's a very good indication we'll talk uh, brief about the sickle cell disease is an inherited blood condition which is most common among the people of african arabian and the indian origin uh, i know there are a lot of from the southeast asia but we have few pockets and few areas and there are a lot of theories going on how the uh, sickle cell cell disease uh, has is related to the migration why india has certain areas where the in india also there is a uh, area in the east and area in the south and an area at the west where i am practicing is the gujarat where there is a pocket for the sickle cell disease in disease of african origin research has led to the models of care with serious complications to improve the quality of life and increase survival in india it is largely undocumented but we have started the work at the gujarat and the chatisgarh level where we have done few patients will show you the data about it so if you see sickle cell anemia in india uh, we are very happy to collaborate as uh, we are collaborating with dr vijay about uh, getting the from iran and uh, from the different other part of the world where the sickle cell disease even in africa where the sickle cell disease is common so if you see india this is where i am practicing is gujarat i am at ahmedabad so there is a area where i did all my cases is bardoli and there are 12 tribal district where the sickle cell anemia is very common and there is a national uh, control program which is going for uh, and if you see the red spot these there is one area in the south of india where it is very common so if you see children with sickle cell disease that is the hemoglobin ss have a significant stroke risk that is why it makes the tcd very important tool to identify before they suffer a stroke and if you can make a screening procedure it's only the technique if you train people for that and if they have a sickle cell centers and if you do tcd for every kid who is having a um, sickle cell disease you can make a hell of a difference to uh, treat such patients and prognosticate them uh, 11% of those sickle cell develop ischemic stroke before the age of 20 and it is a very significant amount and a very reproductive age where you are developing in the physical and every aspect of your age so stroke primary result from the stenosis and occlusion of the distal intracranial inter internal carotid arteries and the proximal middle cerebral artery that is just like a moya moya it is the arteries which are affected where there is a stenotic and then the occlusion is there in sickle cell disease and many of these patient develop moya moya phenomena and network of small collateral vessel to compensate to ic occlusive disease stroke is an important complication for sickle cell disease and approximately 24% of the patient have stroke by the age of 45 and blood transfusion decreases the stroke risk even people are using as have we worked at chatisgarh and at the gujarat level people are using hydroxyurea a lot so when to start a hydroxyurea when to give a blood transfusion it is uh, how you decide upon to keep the patient on those maintenance and when they are not at the risk of the stroke this all can be made by difference if you do a regular tcd screen for such individual and i'll tell you about the protocol one landmark trial done for that and nothing is done after that and it is the only um on the modality which can make a difference if you see the angiographic uh, findings for the children for sickle cell there is a uh, you can see uh, the arteries at the terminal ic and the middle cerebral artery and forming a moya moya pattern Uh, of typical collateral vessels on the uh, slide so several studies demonstrated that the transcranial doppler can be used to identify these children who are at the risk of the stroke so stop trial it's a stroke prevention in sickle cell disease has undertaken to identify children at higher risk of stroke so in this trial there are 130 children who entered this trial and they have not used the peak systolic velocity that we are has been difference has been made and they've used the time average mean of maximum velocities of greater than 200 cm per second in one or both middle cerebral artery or terminal ic at a baseline tcd uh two point which are need to be emphasized 
uh, that uh, they in sickle cell disease they have used uh, a TAM that is the time average mean of maximum in the inter in the two separate occasions separated by two weeks and it is a two megahertz probe which is used which you already discussed about it and if you see the peak systolic is taken here and the TAM is taken at the dichrotic notch where it is measured as a velocity so uh, there is no data of stroke risk for high velocities in other vessels like AC and the posterior cerebral artery, but higher velocities are seen in them also, especially in ACA, but not in the peripheral cere posterior cerebral artery. So high AC and PCA velocities should prompt early repeat examination in an effort, any effort to miss the terminal IC or MCA stenosis. General who meet these entry criteria are indicted either to the transfusion or the standard of care. In that they did. Um, they they did 63 who were randomized to the transfusion and 67 they are trans uh, they were randomized to the standard of care and they found that those who are randomized not to the transfusion not for the treatment arm they have 11 stroke out of 67 so if you see that that is a result indicate a greater than 90 percent of the relative risk reduction in stroke incidents in these treatment patients and it is a huge number um, so. Uh, in 1997, the stroke trial confirmed that TCD can identify children with sickle cell disease at high risk for the first time stroke. And the age recommendation for the early childhood was between the age of 2 to 16, where the TCD screening should be done for sickle cell disease. So you can read, we already discussed about this, uh, the technique for sickle cell you can do in the paper. And this is what I told you about the direction uh, and the depth for the mean flow velocity for the adult. And if you see here, I would like to take you towards the children. If it is less than 170, it is normal um, for the uh, children and uh, for M1. And less than 80 is normal for the vertebral artery. As the diameter, head circumference diameter is changing in the children. So that is very important. The different head diameters, uh, the, the depth, and the velocities, uh, velocities remain same, but the diameter where you see the vessel is different. If the, it is 12 centimeters, MCA is at the 30 to 34, 54. And if the diameter increase to 15 centimeters, it is 40 to 66, which is almost going to near to the adult um, uh, depth where you see the middle cerebral artery. And similar is for the ICA, ACA, and the PCA, the head circumference 12 to 15, these are the depth where you see the vessel. And I tell you, uh, for sickle cell, it is, it is very easy to uh, do the TCD, but it is also very important that you should uh, be trained in TCD because to find a vessel, it is a very translucent uh, temporal bone for the children. You put a probe and you see a plethora of vessels. You see all the vessel at the one time because it's very translucent and, and the diameter is small of the head. So there the techniques come that you don't have the difficulty in finding vessels, but to identify the vessel is very important. So it doesn't take time to do TCD in children. It is, but the, uh, the, the head sometimes have a different thickness. So it may be difficult in the slightly more of age group as we did in our um, study when one of my residents doing the thesis where we did the adult patient uh, at the age of 35 and 40, we, when we are screening in the camp, they, they were not in our trial, 2 to 16, but we still did the TCD for them. It was difficult to find the window. I think the bone thickness has changed the shape in such individuals. So the stop trial scanning protocol, just to mention you about it, the, it is the head diameter is the most important to measure it first. Then expected death according to the head diameter is taken. Sample volume is set to six millimeters because you're going to see a plethora of vessels. So you don't want to be in the sea of the vessels. So you can usually identify that velocity scale is 2 to 100 to 250. So this is how you go uh, one by one from MCA signal you acquired and track down shallow to depth as possible to four more children. And you go to the depth less than 40 millimeters and you go two millimeter increment and track optimize and record the signal at the maximum velocities and slowly you go towards the carotid bifurcation. Uh, ACA you also record it but uh, the protocol which doesn't include in the children because you can affect the lens of the 
of the children by doing the ophthalmic TCD at, the, at a higher power. So the ophthalmic TCD in the children is not involved, included in the stop, stop protocol. So uh, how you measure it, these are the upper, which is incorrect. This is the middle one, which is right. And bottom one is again incorrect, where you look for the time average mean, uh, ma maximum of the mean velocities for the uh, sickle cell. It is 205, so 174, because it makes a difference because there is a value cutoff for the blood transfusion. So in sickle cell disease, if the age is there, there can be effect in the velocities of the TAM, that time average mean of maximum may change uh, with the age. Uh, but the most important is the body temperature. Don't do the TCD when the, when the child is having the fever. Uh, there is a hypoglycemia is there. There is a breath holding is there. Patient is crying. Patient is hyperventilating. So remember that will all alter your change in the uh, finding of the velocities when you are doing the TCD. So if you see the stop classification for risk stratification and the treatment strategy, the normal is less than 170 centimeters. It's a repeat assessment is indicated. This is normal. But conditional is where it is important. I, I remember when I was telling about these data, one of the pediatrician from Nagpur, it's Maharashtra where it is common, where because a pandemic started, we were supposed to start a new site. And we are thinking that we'll do every three months, we're going to uh, do the screening test and we'll go for the camps so we can complete the thousand patient in three years of our uh, tenure. But pandemic has changed a lot of things, not including the job, but making it difficult to reach to the people where you can do the, uh, help them for risk stratification. So conditional is the TAM from 170 to 200 in MCA or terminal IC in children with no previous record, but repeat TCD is warranted about two weeks because less than 170 is normal but 170 to 200 can anytime go to more than 200. So two weeks is important. And if it is more than 200 centimeters per second of MC or terminal ICA, urgent blood transfusion is arranged. And in conditional, I've talked to many pediatrician. Um, if, once the velocities go above 170 and if they are doing the TCD, they prefer such patient to go on hydroxyurea uh, for the condition that they don't suffer the stroke. So this is, this is the trial, which uh, a study which uh, our uh, uh, resident is doing uh, between the age of two to 16 years where they are taking the transcranial Doppler and, um, and they, they, there, is, there is a history of blood transfusion and stroke the previous two years. 30 children were identified. Out of that 53.3 were females. Mean age was nine and had circumference mean was uh, uh, 47 and HBS was greater than 30% in the, all the children's. And we found the MCA P systolic velocity of uh, 91 and end diastolic velocity of 41, and which is very low in comparison to the African where the stroke is very high. So that is the point to do the uh, transcranial Doppler here in Indian settings. Is the Indian subset or the tribal belt having the sickle cell of a different subset? Uh, those who are not suffering more of stroke and having the more of the abdominal crisis or the leg crisis. And this was the discussion with the pediatrician. They say that there are very few patients which comes with a stroke. So it makes a different uh, patterns in different countries or different continent where the stroke is higher in the African part and not in the Indian subset. This is very initial to say that because we only have a 30 uh, children which we have done, but we have to do more than uh, thousand to come to this prediction if we power our study well. Uh, majority, 86 of the children have received the blood transfusion and the iron chelation during the previous two years. We have to stratify uh, this also to define the where should they should give the iron chelation and the um, blood transfusion to such patient. Definitely, if TAM is greater than 200 centimeters, uh, they consider to be the very risk of and out of 30 six were found to have higher than that, that is 20% of the children, of which five were two to eight years of age, and they were put on blood transfusion. And that is why they were not suffered a stroke till yet. So it is a small number of patients we did agree, we, we are increasing our number. And this is from the where we did the TCD for these children, and we found the arteries and that we calculate that the TAM uh, from our subset of the patient. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Here I'll stop.
uh, my presentation for sickle cell. Thank you. Hardik, you're on. So I think I will invite uh, Dr. Vijay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for this session on sickle cell. And thank you also for highlighting the epidemiology of sickle cell disease in uh, globally, actually, and uh, how to screen it using uh, PCD. So we, we do have a question on that, but we'll save it for later. Uh, over to you, Dr. Vijay, for your session on TCD and neuroimaging. Okay. Let me just put the slides up. Uh, so, uh, you know, I will again repeat that what uh, you have been hearing in this two and a half hours time, uh, this is something which, you know, even one week I feel is not enough actually to go through it. Uh, so just consider what we are talking is just a primer. This is just to, to inculcate some kind of interest, you know, in the, in, in in those who are uh, neurologists but uh, are not exposed or not doing TCDs, uh, and uh, probably giving something to those who are uh, doing TCDs, uh, you know, some idea that uh, where you can use it, uh, probably in a better way or more productive way. Uh, so we'll rush through it. Uh, this will be a little bit longer talk because this includes. Uh, nearly 60-70% uh, of TCD, you know, which is done for clinical purposes. It's not three talks, it's almost 70% of TCD practice. Uh, so, uh, I will try to do uh, some kind of justification for you to understand that how TCD helps uh, in, in patients, because this is the commonest disease when we come to seeing patients with stroke, that how do you diagnose intracranial stenosis, which is very common uh, in Asia, uh, in in, in African-Americans, in Hispanics, uh, this is a very, very common disease. Like in Asia, uh, nearly uh, 40 to 50% of stroke patients, uh, they will have one or other intracranial stenosis, which is responsible for stroke. Uh, so again, I'm just showing this book again to you that this is uh, written by, uh, you know, neurosonologists who are neurologists, uh, practicing stroke neurologists and they do uh, ultrasound studies uh, all around the world. There are people, uh, you know, on, on you know on the on the writing committee from Asia, uh, from 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 US, uh, from Europe. Uh, so this is uh, something which is the real experience. The real you know technique has been explained. Uh, you know how you don't need somebody to teach. You can just open this book and just follow the steps. Probably you will get something even if in this. Uh, critical time, you are not able to get somebody uh, for real training. Uh, when it comes to intracranial stenosis, you can do a cerebral angiogram. Nobody does it nowadays just to diagnose, uh, you know, intracranial stenosis. Uh, but it's a gold standard because it provides you a very good picture of the circulation, right, starting from the arch of aorta to all the way to the distal branches of circle of Willis. Uh, you can see very, very distal branches like M1, M2, M3, M4, up to M5. Uh, but uh, it's an invasive procedure and, uh, uh, you know, something nobody likes to do it just for the sake of diagnosing it. Uh, you can do an MR angiogram, uh, you know, if you're doing a, a time of flight, which is the commonest way to do it. The only problem with this one is that this is something which overestimates. Overestimate in the sense that if there's a 50% dysnosis, it may look like 60, 70 or 75%. If it is like a 75 or 80 percent, it may look like an occlusion on, 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 on MRA. If you want to increase sensitivity, then just add contrast and do a contrasted MRA. It provides additional uh, picture about the brain parenchyma also, which is of highest resolution. Uh, CT angio, this is widely available. It's available everywhere. Uh, it's a very fast test as compared to MRI. Uh, the only thing is that it involves some kind of radiation. Uh, and uh, it includes the use of contrast uh, where the kidney uh, function, they come into picture. And there is a very small amount of radiation exposure. Uh, you know, I conducted one research part where we were looking at how much is the radiation exposure. So I can tell you for routine use, the radiation exposure is quite low, uh, you know, when it comes to the dangerous levels because the risk of radiation is cumulative. It's not like one test. It is over a period of time. But even if somebody, your stroke patient is getting, say, one CT scan, one CT angio on arrival, then you give TPA, and the next day again you do a CT and CT angiogram, 
and then during the course of this you do one or two times either a city ngo or do a city perfusion uh, it all remains within acceptable limits of uh, radiation hazards to your patient so so radiation part is not something which we are worried because the scanners are becoming very fast uh, they are using a uh, very low amount low low intensity of radiation so uh, radiation is not a concern but definitely yes contrast uh, nephropathy is always a concern now this is the problem which i was telling you about mra so on this side you can see on the on the on the uh, mra if you look at it the left mca looks like it's a cut off it's a 100% occlusion but the same patient when you take this patient for ct angiogram you say fine this is a severe stenosis however i can see the distal filling so mra time of flight it is just over calling the stenosis that's the only problem with it uh, but otherwise the resolution is good so there is no problem in that one even you look at it you know the the the, the whole circle of valis in both of them it looks almost similar there's not much difference except you are seeing the basilar artery because it's a reconstructed mra and this one is not reconstructed uh, you know tcd is scores over all of them for many reasons one it's a bedside this is totally non invasive it's very fast it's real time imaging uh, it's relatively cheap once you have the machine then there's no cost because gel is very very cheap uh, it's very reliable uh, if you have been doing it uh, and uh, you can you can do a longer monitoring this is the only modality ultrasound is the only modality in this world which can detect emboli your your, your ct ct and your mr or dsa they can never detect an emboli which is a very important component for stroke pathophysiology uh, i talked about operator dependency and i told you that uh, if uh, somebody is following my regime that one week of uh, a dedicated training followed by uh, one patient uh, you know per day for three days in a week uh, one month you become an expert a tcd person uh, it's a very reliable technique but this is one meta analysis actually which we uh, did uh, you know long ago in 2007 and we said that whether you are using a mca mean flow cut off velocity of 80 or you are using 100 you look quite good at least as a screening tool uh, so this is a wonderful screening tool it's a it has got a very good sensitivity very good specificity so in terms of just detecting it's a it's a it's a wonderful tool and i gave you a range 80 to 100 so many people use 80 some people use 100 and people use different criteria uh, i will concentrate mainly on mca stenosis because i always say that if you are a lazy neurologist you don't want to learn a lot just learn about mca uh, almost like 75 to 80% of strokes they are occurring in mca territory and if you learn only how to do a mca on tcd then you are 85% mca specialist or tcd specialist uh so this is a wonderful tool at least for, for you know for those people the problem comes here that if you follow the asian criteria people have used a peak systolic velocity as a cut off for moderate mca stenosis that is 50% dysmorphism say a 140 cm per second but there are people who have used 180 also then if you go to west to us people usually use mean flow velocity the formula is very simple like you calculate mean arterial blood pressure that means end diastolic velocity plus you just one third of uh, you know the, the 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 difference between peak systolic and end diastolic that gives you mean flow velocity uh, people have used even 100 as a diagnostic criteria and there are people who say i want not to be doing a, only a screening test i want to be pretty sure that i'm picking up a real stenosis they have used even 120 uh this is called as a zenithing index which was like side to side that means right mca versus left mca because it's patient's own brain if there is a 30% difference then the side with higher velocity is counted as having a moderate or 50% stenosis people have used side to side ratio of 1 to 2 also people have used affected to non affected segment that means you say it's a m2 stenosis so i say fine m2 is this velocity m1 is this velocity m2 divided by m1 this gives you a ratio or you do a stenosis to pre stenosis ratio that means you have a stenosis say in mid m1 and then you say fine in the proximal m1 this was the stenosis let me take a spr stenosis to pre stenosis ratio which adds on your diagnostic criteria and this list continues people have used brui as a criteria people have used blunted flow as a criteria so 
do not worry at all about it the method is you can follow any one of them at least from so I, what i practice is this just follow this one and follow this one so either a peak systolic velocity of more than 140 or mean flow velocity of more than 80. you say this is where i will say that this is a moderate stenosis and then for my learning curve because everybody's technique is different everybody's machines are different everybody's population is different so what you do is you take 10 patients where you diagnose peak systolic velocity more than 140 or mean flow velocity of more than 80 send them to do a ct angiogram and then compare yourself 10 patients only so each patient is giving you about 14 or 15 intracranial arteries so that means if you do 10 you are simply having about 150 samples where tcd can be compared with dsa or with a ct angiogram and then you do reverse that somebody has already done a ct angio you know the diagnosis that this was a mca stenosis bring him to your lab and find out whether you can pick it up so this gives you another 140 150 samples so within a week or within 10 days you get about 300 samples you compare yourself that in your lab whether 140 works better or whether 150 works one you know 150 centimeters per second is a better criteria or 180 is a better is a better criteria this is called as validation against ct angio and then you keep using that criteria to diagnose moderate stenosis but the important thing is as the time goes your technique starts improving and if the technique starts improving your criteria may change so keep doing this validation just on 10 patients each and then you will know fine in my lab i'm going to use this number as the method of diagnosing a moderate stenosis in a patient so this is the way so you don't need to depend on any criteria which are described just use any one criteria test yourself and design and decide your own own, own criteria arvind showed you this picture this is a very important picture to understand how the blood flows in the brain so you just look at this this is having this x axis which is showing the diameter reduction so here the patient's artery is fully open 100 percent patent and as we go to this side this is showing the gradual stenosis which is developing then this particular curve is showing the mean flow velocity in centimeters per second in this curve which you are seeing is this one centimeters per second or you use doppler frequency so doppler frequency shift is it's in kilohertz so one kilohertz is equal to 31 centimeters per second but those people who do core physics instead of writing centimeters per second they write kilohertz so both are equal so just multiply it by 31 so as the stenosis is progressing from zero percent to 50 percent the velocity in a person it becomes double when this becomes 70 percent the velocity becomes triple so when it becomes a doubling of velocity that means if my right MCA is having a mean flow velocity of 60 and my left is having a mean flow velocity of 120, it's already doubled on this side. So that I can say my left MCA is already having a moderate stenosis. But then if it goes to 300 or 200, then I say it has become three times or more. That means this is equal to 70% stenosis. So this is the relationship between diameter and flow velocity on TCD. But then the brain cells are not working on flow velocity brain cells are working on volume of blood flow cbf so cbf is ml per 100 grams of brain per minute so now we are talking about this cbf so if you look at cbf or cbv this is as your velocity is increasing from zero percent no no diameter no diameter stenosis this is your velocity by the time you reach nearly 70 percent stenosis the volume of flow has not changed that means our brain having a power of autoregulation, it continues to do vasodilatation to maintain the blood flow. And only when the stenosis crosses 70%, this is where the volume flow starts dropping. This is where the brain cells start suffering with hypoxia or lack of glucose or lack of blood supply. And this is where the stroke risk increases. So this is called a Spencer's curve of cerebral hemodynamics. So I have shown you the x-axis, I showed you the y-axis, the z-axis, but there's one more axis here, which is we are all talking about diameter stenosis. When we say moderate stenosis, 50% stenosis in diameter. Our arteries are not paper. 
that you draw diameter only. They are cylinders, they are pipes. Pipe means it's an area. So area is pi r square. So you look at it, when you have somebody who is having a 50% stenosis, his, his area in the artery, if you open up the artery, it has reduced by nearly 75%. When you reach 70%, the lumen has reduced by nearly 91%. So 70% stenosis is not 70% stenosis. 10 millimeters has not become 3 millimeters. The 10 millimeter, when you cut open the artery, it has remained only 1 millimeter inside out of 10. So because the, the relationship is like this. So this is a very, very severe. So 70% is not a mild stenosis or 50% is not a mild stenosis. 70% means you have removed 75% of the lumen from this patient because of the plaque. Uh, when we started doing it, we saw multiple kinds of stenosis. We saw this is the commonest type of stenosis, a focal stenosis short segment, which is where we put all these criteria of diagnosing by TCD. But then we have some patients who have a long segment of stenosis. So we defined it as any stenosis which is more than one centimeter in length. Or we have patients who have got multiple beads of stenosis, like what you see in vasculitis. That one stenosis here, then normal artery, then one stenosis here. Or you, this is the commonest variety which is seen in patients who are having multiple vascular risk factors, including IHD, uh, hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, smoking, where you see stenosis in almost every single artery, like this patient. There is a stenosis in the right MCA, there is a stenosis in the right PCA, there is a stenosis in the left PCA, and there is a stenosis in the basilar artery. So these are the patients. So that's a spectrum of disease. It starts with one artery focal stenosis, long segments of stenosis, multifocal segment of stenosis, multiple arteries involved. So these patients, they do not follow the Spencer's curve because they are real vascular pets. So these, so this is the kind of patterns which you see on TCD. So if you look at it, this is a normal, a normal TCD. What Arvin showed you, a sharp upstroke. There's a peak here, then there's a dichrotic noise, then there's end diastole. But you can see this kind of flow, which is a high velocity, and a normal PI. But then you can have this kind of vasodilated flow where the diastolic flow has really gone up. But the one which I showed you, which are on this side of the Spencer's curve, that means more than 70% stenosis, they develop this kind of blood flow and this kind of blood flow where the flow is slow as well as showing a higher resistance. So these are not the routine patient which you diagnose. They are really severe. This is the definition of severe stenosis. So all the criteria which I showed you, they are called as moderate stenosis. Moderate means 50% or more. Severe means 70% or more. Now, this is what we say. This is a diffuse intracranial disease. That's the definition of diffuse intracranial disease. So again, I show you one patient. So this is a 56-year-old male, presents with transient TIA, a TIA, which is transient right side weakness on the right side because the left MCA. And there is some kind of speech difficulty. So it's a cortical kind of TIA which you are seeing. And it's a severe stenosis or quite a long segment of stenosis. Now, when we look at it, so there's a very high flow velocity which you are seeing. So you can see here, this is 208 mean. I showed you the normal, we keep cut off for 50% stenosis, 80 centimeters per second. This person is having 208. And not only that, in order to maintain the blood flow, if you look at this RI, this is going low. So this is a vasodilated. So patient's brain is already working hard to maintain the cerebral blood flow volume so that the, the brain does not suffer from ischemia. But there are certain situations where the, whether the patient becomes a little bit dehydrated, patient blood pressure drops because of some reasons, he has been working hard in the hot weather. So all these things, that time, this compensation may not be enough and he may develop some symptoms. Uh, the, so this is exactly what happens in this patient that now the stenosis is there, but in addition to the stenosis, not only a harsh brew like, not like this kind of sound, you start hearing this kind of as seagulls murmur. So this means that your patient is having a nearly a 90% stenosis. It's a very tight stenosis. It is something like this, which we used to do when we were kids. Take your copy, two pages, 
put into the lips and blow air, it will produce musical sound. So when the stenosis becomes really very tight, it starts producing musical sounds, which are because of tones and overtones and may various harmonics come in between. And then it starts looking like a, having a musical character. Now, this is what TC, what TC diagnosed. So you have a patient who presented with a TIA, which was cortical. You did a CT angiogram, which showed a tight stenosis. Then you did a TCD, which showed a real severe stenosis, which is showing a vasodilated flow and a very high flow velocity. Now the question comes, why did this patient develop a TIA? So TIA can develop because of either embolization. That means there was a plaque, a part of the plaque broke away, distally embolized and caused a stroke or caused a TIA. Or it may be because of hypoperfusion, the blood pressure drops from the, for some reason, either dehydration or taking some medicines or hyperventilating, or it's a combination of two. So we believe that mostly it is either artery to artery embolization or a combination of the two. Pure hypoperfusion is not something of very, very common phenomena. It happens by usually a combination of the two. Or patient may develop bleeding. So we have done a CT angiogram or CT. It did not show a bleeding. So this causes out. Now we need to identify because if this is embolization, then the treatment is increasing your anti-thrombotic therapy. If this is the cause, then the treatment is keep the blood pressure high, keep the patient well hydrated. So we need to identify. So our TCD, we just put the TCD and just monitor the MCA on the left side. And what you see is when you play it, so this is what you hear is the definition is for 40 seconds, 40 minutes, and you hear just one emboli, it just says the cause of TIA in this patient was artery to artery embolization. And what you need to do is you need to use higher amount of anti-thrombotic medications. So we put this patient on a combination of aspirin plus clopidogrel for one month. And then after that, we put the patient only on clopidogrel. And then for next two years, this patient remained asymptomatic. Because we know in this patient, the risk of stroke, it may be up to 20% per year on best medical therapy. We know it from Sempris trial that these patients are not low risk category patient. Now, what are the other treatment options? Can we do endovascular intervention like putting a stent or doing a balloon angioplasty? Is there some kind of surgery or is there some kind of other treatment which we can do for our patient? So about the stenting, the Sempris trial is the last trial which we have available at present with some kind of evidence it and it said very very clearly that your medical therapy is much better in terms of stroke prevention as compared to doing a stenting for these patients there are various reasons why the stenting failed and why the best medical therapy worked better the technology is changing very fast the future will be that probably most of the patients will start getting angioplasty or getting a stents, intracranial stenting done. At present, intracranial stenting in this trial was associated with more than 10% peri-procedural risk, which is not acceptable. The 10% means one out of every 10 patient is going to have an event because of the angio, uh, angioplasty and putting a stent. So we are not ready for recommending uh, putting a stent for everyone with intracranial stenosis at present because the technology is improving. Now, if you put a wrong stent in somebody, you end up into problem. So this is what was done in one of the patients by a cardiologist. He was doing a stenting for the coronary arteries, which was very successful. And then he thought, I'm having the catheter in. Let me shoot one dye into the carotid arteries. So he put dye and then he found a barely 50% dysphenosis in the left ICA. And then he said, because this is a progressive disease, after two years, this will become 70% and you can get a stroke. Since I'm already in with the catheter, let me put a stent here. And he put not a carotid stent he, because he was not having a carotid stent. He just put a stent in the carotid artery. Patient immediately developed a neck pain on the left side. The swelling on the left side. And then she continued to have severe neck pain. And then she came. And this is what we did the ultrasound, which was showing a pseudo aneurysm developing because of the injury to the artery. And when we did a CT angiogram, you can see these grapes hanging, multiple grapes hanging in this one. And we had to open up and correct it. And we found it, this artery was fragile. There was a TB infection actually. So probably this stent 
was infected, it was not even sterilized. The technique was not good. It was done in some other country. And we had to sacrifice the carotid artery because there was no possibility of already looking. It was already leaking. It was oozing blood. It was just preparing itself to rupture. The blowout is immediate death. So we had to sacrifice it. Patient ended up with a severe left MCA stroke because that was the only procedure to save the patient's life. So at present, we are not ready. But yes, we do selective patients. We do stenting in our patient. Uh, technique will keep on improving and we will have some answers. Whether we can give them warfarin, so there have been a couple of studies which have tested. The most quoted one is this Vossid study. Vossid study showed that warfarin in a very tight therapeutic range of 2 to 3 INR, it looks like it is better than aspirin. But it's a very difficult drug to handle. So it's not an easy drug to handle. And we know it, the clinical trials which were done, they did not show any benefit of anticoagulation on aspirin. So at present, there is no place for anticoagulation for patients with endocrine stenosis. Antiplatelet therapy remains a mainstay, and that too for a short duration. Now, this was one study which was done in Asia Pacific. It was Hong Kong, uh, Philippines, Thailand, uh, Singapore. These are the countries which participated. It was like this, that you have a severe stenosis and you show emboli. We give them double antiplatelet therapy, and then we repeat and we count the emboli. The, just with the starting of uh, uh, you know, antiplatelet therapy aggressively, the emboli count disappears, and it also results into a trend towards stroke prevention. So short-term antiplatelet therapy is okay. Long-term, no. Long-term, it has to be a single antiplatelet therapy. Short-term means up to one month or three months. Don't go beyond that. And this is exactly what was seen in, in, in the CHANCE trial, which was done in China. We showed that a double antiplatelet therapy for three weeks is safe. It is better in stroke prevention. A lot of strokes can be prevented. And the same thing was seen in the recent POINT trial, which was done in mostly in American population. Same again with clopidogrel with aspirin versus aspirin alone. Same thing was seen. A short-term duration of aspirin plus clopidogrel, that with one month, is safe. It is effective in preventing strokes. Now we move to the second uh, case. Second case is a younger patient, 43. No past history of diabetes, hypertension, or the usual vascular risk factor. Recurrent episodes of right sided weakness as well as language difficulty. Examination by the time neurologist sees is normal. We write the diagnosis as TIA. We do a CT and CTA. So you can see the CT scan does not show a damage on the brain, but we see a very tight stenosis of the left MCA. Uh, this is like we call it as a, with the musical murmur and a lot of collaterals which you are seeing around here, which are developing just to compensate for the blood flow. We do an MRI and there is a small cortical stroke in the posterior watershed region. Uh, and we did the TCD and there were no hits, no microembolic signals. We did it multiple times because we were giving antiplatelet therapy and still the patient was getting recurrent episodes. Uh, so diagnosis is not a problem. Diagnosis is the same. It's a TIA. Uh, and we know it. It's secondary to the diagnosis to the stenosis of MCA. Uh, but what does it mean? Uh, patient says, you have the diagnosis, but I'm still getting these episodes. So something has to be done for me. So we say, fine, it could be atherosclerosis. It could have been a dissection. Is it a Moya Moya disease? Or is it something which we don't know? Like kind of vasculitis or vasculopathy, which we don't know the cause. So even the cause does not help us much because we say, whatever it is, it's not embolization. So this is mostly hypoperfusion. And that was true. This patient used to get these TIA attacks in certain situations only. Not every, not every minute. Most of them like early morning, that when he gets up from sleep and he was snoring and he was having some kind of obstructive sleep apnea. So as we told, double antiplatelet therapy is fine, short term, followed by single antiplatelet agent. This we did, but still patients were getting episodes. Stenting, I told you, this is a very tight stenosis. One, it's not amenable for stenting. Two, I told you, it's a high periprocedural risk. We don't want to refer these patients for everyone to go for the stenting. The question is, is there any other treatment? And if I want to do any other thing, I need to say, is it high risk or is it a low risk? If it's a low risk, then I should not be worried. If it's a high risk, I should be worried. So one thing which I did for this patient was, because of OSA, I put him on nocturnal CPAP. So that one part, I took it away. 
So, but TCD helps. So very simple test, just put this Spencer's head frame on the head. This is the probe which is monitoring the right MCA. This is the probe which is monitoring left MCA and just monitor. So monitoring for 40 seconds for the micro, 40 minutes for microembolic signals and do something else. And that something else is ask the patient to hold breath. Ask the patient to hold breath for 30 seconds. And in 30 seconds, because of the increase of carbon dioxide in that 30 seconds, the artery vasodilates and the blood flow should improve. Now, what we told initially, every artery is having a signature. Now you look at this, this is the right MCA and this is the left MCA. Why the two are different? The shapes are different. This is rounded top and this is not rounded top. This is two MCAs, same patient, same heart, because this is basically each heartbeat, but they look different. So one side is having a disease as compared to other. So this is a TB2 flow, this is okay flow. This is not from this patient, this is from another patient. And then when you ask the patient to hold breath, both should increase. Now, this is... I'll stop it here and I'll show you that if you look at it, we started from here on the left and it went up all the way. It increased during breath holding. But this one is started from here and there's hardly any increase. So the two arteries, although they belong to the same person, same breath holding, same increase of carbon dioxide in the brain, but the two arteries are behaving in different manner. So that means this artery is not able to vasodilate further when there's a challenge. The challenge means either he is having an apneic spell during sleep, or he is not drinking enough water, or his blood pressure is dropping, or you are do using a too much of antihypertensive medication. So something is having, you know, creating the problem for him, or he's working in a hot weather and not drinking at that time. So this is what was looking like in our patient. So same thing on the right side, the waveform is different as compared to the left. This is a blunted waveform. See that upstroke, a delayed peak. This peak is almost straight. This peak is delayed peak. It's a vasodilated artery. You see the relationship between peak systolic and diastolic and compare with the relationship here. So this PI is much, much lower as compared to this PI. So this is a vasodilated one. And then what we do is, we same thing, breath holding index, we calculate for this patient to see vasodilatory reserve. That means when this patient goes into a challenging situation, can he maintain the blood flow or not? So this is one study which was done long ago for patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis with same breath holding. This is the formula which we use. The mean flow velocity at the end of 30 seconds of breath holding minus mean flow velocity at rest divided by mean flow velocity at rest and then 100 divided by number of seconds of breath holding. So we use this formula and this formula says if your this number is more than 0.69, you are in the low risk category. But if this number is less than 0.69, your risk is nearly four times higher to get a ischemic event. So you belong to a high risk category. So we applied the same thing on our patient and then you can see it. This is exactly what happened. On the right side, which is a normal side, patient is started with a mean flow velocity of 50. End of 30 seconds, it increased to 66. Using this formula, his breath holding index is coming as 0.89, which is more than 0.69. It's normal. But on the other hand, on the left side, we see we start from a velocity of 22, but at the end of breath holding, instead of increasing, it is showing a decrease. So the breath holding index comes in minus. So this is an exhausted vasodilatory reserve. That means the two arteries are connected by ACA. So the right side, which is a strong one, it is stealing the blood from the left. When it vasodilates, it needs blood. When it needs blood, it just says this is a poor artery steal from this one. So a rich artery is stealing from the poor artery. This phenomena. It can be tested by other modalities. You can do a CT perfusion and just give estrozolomide to these patients and just see. So this was the metabolic perfusion in this patient on inspect. You can see at rest, there's a little bit of less perfusion on the left side. You can see here, the right is having 54% of the gamma ray count, while the left is having 46. When we challenge it with estrozolomide, which is exactly same as holding breath, because estrozolomide will also increase carbon dioxide in the brain, but on a sustained manner. 
when we challenge and repeat the scan again, see this 53, it becomes 59%. But this 46, it drops further. So this is, that means there is a steel phenomena which is occurring, that the right is stealing the blood from the left whenever there is a situation of challenge. So this is where you need to find out something. So for these patients, we still do this surgery in some patients who are younger. We just cut little part of the temporal bone, take the superficial temporal artery from here and just put it into the brain. This is called as the STA, MCA bypass surgery or ECI bypass surgery. It works. And this is exactly what happened in this patient. This is the spect which you are seeing, I just showed you uh, before surgery. We did the surgery and after four months, we repeated. Now there is no more steel phenomena. The brain looks perfectly perfused and this works wonderfully well. Not only this surgery, it improves the cognitive parameters because now there's more blood flow going to the left hemisphere. The cognition will improve and also it improves cerebral hemodynamic parameter and improves the patient's risk of stroke also. So this is one way of removing hypoperfusion. But again, this is a surgery. It's not acceptable. Very difficult to convince person to do surgery on the brain. Everybody is worried that this surgery, although this surgery is done outside the surface of the brain, but it's, still, it's a surgery. It will have definitely surgical complications. So this is one possible method in carefully selected patient to remove the hypoperfusion. Now, I do a lot of research. So this is one thing which I've been doing currently for these patients. So this is called as enhanced external counter pulsations. This is same like intra-aortic balloon pumping for coronary artery disease, except this is non-invasive. We do it from outside. This technique was discovered for patients with chronic refractory coronary artery disease. I'm just trying to see whether it works in intracranial disease or not. So that it works like this. This person is lying on this couch, which is a machine, uh, and it is having this something like a blood pressure cuff, one on the leg, one on the lower thigh, and one on the upper thigh. So there are three blood, three cuffs which inflate air. He is having this ECG electrodes. So machine picks up the QRS complex, and then these balloons, they inflate one by one. The lower one, then the middle one, then the upper one, separated by about 50 milliseconds. Something like somebody is squeezing the blood from leg up towards the brain. This is called an enhanced external counter pulsation. And how it plays is this. The, it looks like something like this. This is how it plays. That uh, a patient's legs are just jumping up and down. He's awake. He is not having any problems. So this is done for one hour every day for five days a week and for a total of seven weeks. That means 35 sessions. Before that, I do their... Uh, SPECT and TCD studies uh, and then repeat them after four months and just see what happens to their cerebral perfusion as well as their clinical parameters. So this is how the screen works. So that's the ECG of the patient. Now this is from the finger plethysmograph. So you are seeing systole, diastole, systole, diastole. Now see what happens when the machine starts. So see the machine starts just keep looking at this part where my arrow is. Keep looking at this part and the machine starts moving. One feet here, second feet starts the feeling good as this. Or you see double feet. So one feet is moving up here, second feet is moving up here, this is moving right on here. It looks like the heartbeat is something like a double. There is one patient owns one machine. So this is the heartbeat of the patient. 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 For the long run, so this is called a EECP. So this is one patient whom, you know, which I just published actually in European Journal of Neurology just uh, earlier this month only. That this is patient SPECT, which was done at baseline. There's the old stroke on the left side, but. When we challenge, the patient was having symptoms on the right MCA territory. You see baseline perfusion looks quite good. But as we give him the Dimox, the estrozolomide challenge, there is a reduced metabolic perfusion on the right MCA territory, a big reduction. Then we give him this treatment for seven weeks. And now you see, this is the baseline scan, which is same like this one. But the Dimox challenge, there is no more still phenomenon now. So this patient, all symptoms have disappeared. 
is MMSE, which was just 21 points actually to start with, now has gone to 29 points. So even his cognition is improving after this, and he is doing very good for last one and a half year. Uh, so for intercranial stenosis, this is a summary. It's a very common disease. Asians, Hispanics, uh, Latin Americans, uh, African Americans. Very, very common disease. But very common for Asians, number is about 50% of stroke patients, they have intercranial stenosis as compared to just 8% in Caucasian population. So 8 versus 50, it's a huge difference. When we are treating our patients, it's very important that you should know the mechanism of stroke. If you know the mechanism of stroke, then the treatment becomes easy. Then you are doing the right treatment. Medical therapy is still the mainstay of treatment. Double antiplatelets, they can be given for short term, not for long term. Technology for stenting is evolving at present. There will be a day in few years time that it will become probably the standard of care for these patients. You can do STMC bypass surgery, but you need to be very careful in selecting patient. It's not something that everybody can be subjected to do STMC bypass surgery. And there are new modalities. People are working on a daily basis to find out new modalities, how they work. Then I will come to the second part, which is vasospathum. So that finishes intercranial stenosis and vasomotor reactivity. Now, when we talk about vasospathum, so TCD was discovered or given for human use in 1982. It's a very young technology. For human use in 1982 to see the blood flow in middle cerebral artery in patients after subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it was actually discovered for subarachnoid hemorrhage and mainly for the vasospasm. Now this is one patient who developed a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see the subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's probably one of the aneurysms which are sitting at MCA bifurcation, which bled. So this is... Now the problem is that uh, it is not a very common cause of stroke, but it's a very dangerous cause. Dangerous in the sense, see, only all strokes, ischemic hemorrhagic, subarachnoid hemorrhage, just about 3%. But when it comes to mortality, 5%. So although it has got only 3%, but it contributes to a lot of mortality. Commonest cause is still is rupture of an aneurysm in the brain, but there are some other causes which can cause it. End result is same. That's a problem. That by the time patient comes to the hospital, 25% or 21% people die before they reach the hospital. After they reach the hospital, it's about 1% mortality per hour if you don't secure the aneurysm. And most of these deaths are because of a re bleeding of the aneurysm. So, emergency is secure the aneurysm, whether you clip the aneurysm or you do a coiling of the aneurysm. And the 30 day mortality is 44%. So, you look at it. Overall, nearly 40%, 45% patients, they die because of this disease. So it's a very dangerous disease. And this is the most dreaded complication of subarachnoid hemorrhage, but it's a treated, treatable compli com complication if you identify it as early. There are various definitions which people use for vasospasm. It usually is, we use the TCD definition of vasospasm. The advantage of using TCD definition of vasospasm is that we pick up vasospasm in 45% of people. As compared to if you use only clinical criteria, only 16%, that means you will be treating patients 16% patient only. That some of them, they will be ignoring your eyes. If you do angiogram for everyone, only 20%, right? So that means it is, so these are delayed cerebral ischemia in 21%, angiographic only in 31%. But if you diagnose more, that means you will be more careful in 45% patients. So that means it is a progressive disease. It occurs on a daily basis, increases. So if you know about it, you will treat it better. There are various theories why people develop vasospasm. The crux is blood inside the arteries is good. Blood outside the arteries, the arteries get irritation. So arteries don't like the blood outside them. They like the blood to be inside the arteries only. So once the blood goes outside, oxyhemoglobin, serotonin, prostaglandin, catecholamines, angiotensin, all these chemicals, they are released and they all lead to vasospasm. The, it starts by day three and it peaks by day seven mostly. In some people, it can be on the day two also. It can be a severe vasospasm. Problem is when the vasospasm occur, it behaves like a stenosis and it can cause ischemic injury. So you have a person who comes to the hospital with bleeding and dies because of ischemic stroke. 
so which is not a good thing to happen this is still used criteria actually that we use this cutoffs of mean flow velocity in the mca and we use the lindergaard ratio which is a ratio of mean flow velocity in the ipsilateral mca compared to the ica the arvin told you one sub mandibular approach where you put the probe here and take the blood flow from the artery intracranial artery extracranial right intracranial artery in the extracranial segment with using the tcd probe and then you use this one to calculate the lindergaard ratio some people call it hemispheric index also it's same thing and then you say is it hyperemia or is it spasm is it mild moderate severe these are different grades and then you treat them accordingly you want your patients to move from here upwards so if wherever you get it if you catch the patient here move them upwards with treatment so these are some of the poor prognostic factors if the lindergaard ratio moves more than 6 pulse pi it just increases suddenly or decreases suddenly or there is a early appearance of vessel spasm uh so like like this is one patient so this is the day 2 when we do we see mean flow velocity of 77 here right it's not showing the pi so pi is looking like normal but the same patient when you do the same tcd on 4 days on day 4 the velocity from 77 has gone to 208 and i told you if it doubles it is 50% dysmosis if it triples it is 70% dysmosis this is almost tripled so this is like 70% dysmosis developing in this patient 70 so vessel spasm is causing causing a stenosis which is equal to 70% the treatment traditionally it has been triple h therapy but nowadays intensivists they don't like the 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 hemodilution part because it has got a lot of complications so most of the time it is double h which is hypertension induced and hypervolemia so these two are the main stay of treatment that you do volume expansion and induce hypertension so this just increases the blood flow into the brain whatever you are using sometimes we take our patients for even intraaortic balloon pump sometimes we do angioplasty or sometimes we do intra arterial pepavirine or nowadays people inject nimodipine directly into the intracranial arteries so this is one patient she was just very young girl Uh, developed a uh, rupture of one of the aneurysm there was sah and then we clip the aneurysm on day 1 so currently clipping and coiling they are considered equal it totally depends on the availability and the site if the site is very deep then people go for clipping if the site is amenable to 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 putting a stent they go for this one uh, and then she was put on daily uh, tcd uh now this is another one which is there there is an aneurysm you are seeing this aneurysm here on dsa we did the ct angio so this is the 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 the, the aneurysm which you are seeing on the very terminal ica proximal mca site uh this is reconstructed so reconstructed is like this when you do this kind of reconstruction the right becomes right and the left becomes left so that's why it's the same thing which was looking on the left mca here now the left appears on this side they have not flipped it uh so this is the aneurysm which bled in our patient this is the aneurysm so you can see it was clipped very nicely you don't see it it's very nice reconstruction on after after this one the angiogram after clipping it and then this is what happened to to this patient on day 3 or day 4 uh you can see it <laughs> a little bit of bruise which is appearing so we started with this double edge therapy but then on day 4 the patient starts becoming lethargic not very alert little bit of drowsy and then you can see these velocities are increasing 188 here on this side 226 here this is a lindergaard ratio which you calculate for this patient this because this is 36 here 226 here so this is almost 6 lindergaard ratio here and almost 6 here almost 5 5 and a half here so both of them are equal to severe vessel spasm which is developing in both arteries because blood was there on both sides uh and then on day 5 she developed aphasia in addition to a right sided weakness which developed despite the treatment and this is what when we did the tcd this is what like a flat kind of flow it's so much of vessel dilatation occurring in the artery now with blunted flow so this is if you remember the spencer's curve 
This is almost like 95 to 98 percent stenosis. So said, we said this is a very, very severe stenosis. Although the flow, instead of increasing, it has dropped. The PI has gone up. So this is the difference. So this is on day three, the TCD which I showed you. And that's the TCD which became on day six. Sudden drop, sudden change in the MCA signatures. You see, this is all the signature of MCA on day three. And now the signature becomes like this for this patient. Something is terribly wrong with this patient. We did a CT perfusion for this patient. Now you can see it. If you look at the CBF, there the CBF is markedly reduced on the left middle cerebral artery territory. When you do the middle, the MTT, it's markedly prolonged, the MTT on the left MCA side. So this patient is in severe vessel spasm. And it, we were right. When we did the angiogram, you look at the MCA, how the MCA looks like. It's a very tiny, just a thread-like a thing which is going here. On two views, you can see even on the other side is like a thread. So we did actually angioplasty also. And in addition to that, we injected intra-arterial nemodipine, which resolved. See, the velocities have dropped now. They are not no longer. If you calculate this one here, this one, 20, 30, 67 minus 27. So this will be 20, about 40 here mean. Now, if you take this mean, so if you, even if you take this mean, this is 40, this is 112, just three times. So this is not like six times higher Lindegard ratio, not six times higher. So probably we have achieved better. She developed very good speech after this. Her power on the right side improved. And she made a very nice recovery because this is day seven, we repeated CT perfusion. And now you see there is no difference between the MTT on two sides. There is no difference on the cerebral blood flow on two sides. She made a wonderful recovery, modified ranking scale of one at three months. So this is the kind of life which you can give if you are very careful and you are doing the right things at the right time. The right thing is these are sick patients. You cannot keep moving them every time for doing all investigation. But if you have a bedside TCD machine, you can put the TCD machine. We do it on a daily basis, but you can do it even twice a day if you are doing something. In addition to that, because when people get meningitis, encephalopathy, you know, you know, encephalopathy, encephalitis, it's the same process which happens. Something like a vasospasm, vasculitis occurs. Same like a disease occurs. So if you are monitoring your patients with TCD during that time, especially in TB meningitis, which has a protected course, vasculitis occurs very, very commonly in these patients. Then you can diagnose not only diagnose it, you can design your 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 uh, steroid therapy. That it's not like this, there's a fixed dose of steroids. If your patient is developing a severe vasculitis, severe vessel spasm, TCD is showing development or evolving vessel spasm, you can always even pulse them with methyl at that time because you're already covering them with anti-tubercular therapy and you can improve the outcomes. It's just that, and it doesn't take time, I told you, because you know you are going directed. You know I'm going to see only two MCAs and I'm going to see them every day. I'm going to chart them that this is today, this is tomorrow, this is day after tomorrow. If this is changing the pattern, something is going wrong with the patient and I need to reconsider, re-evaluate my treatment. So this is how we do it, that TCD is definitely a very reliable tool for diagnosing vasospasm. It's an extremely reliable tool for monitoring vasospasm. And then this is a very reliable tool, not only for diagnosing and monitoring, but also for guiding you the treatment as well as assessing the effects of your treatment, whether your treatment is working or your treatment is not working or you need to escalate the treatment, you need to de-escalate the treatment. The rules are you start very early because you need to know patient's own blood flow. What is patient's inherent blood flow? So that you can do on the very first day. So obtain on the day one, keep doing it frequently, daily basis, and if the patient's neurological condition changes, you can do even twice a day. Do the treatment, change the treatment, increase blood pressure, increase hydration, come back after four or six hours, do it again. See whether your treatment is working or not. If your treatment is not working, escalate more. And if your treatment is working, you can start relaxing your treatment. And always, TCD is not a replacement for CT NGO. CT is, TCD is not a replacement for MR NGO or DSA. It is a complementary test. It guides you when to do the test at the right time. Because you cannot keep moving your patient every day to do a CT angiogram. It tells you when is the right time to do the CT angio, when the CT angiogram is going to help in patient's management. And this is where I will end. So 
we, we have just shown you an overview that where you know doing a cerebral vascular ultrasound we did not touch the neck part in this you know in these two two and a half hours we did only the tcd part but definitely doing a tcd is half the picture you should always look at the carotid arteries also and the vertebral arteries in the neck also uh, so i hope that we have been able to generate interest uh, in those people who have not been doing tcds uh, and probably those who have been doing we might have given you some suggestions that how to utilize it to the maximum and just benefit your patients as much as you can and have the best possible outcomes thank you very much thank you dr vijay and if time comes we'll do the carotid part also if the interest has generated in the uh, all the part hardik to you sorry thank you thank you thank you sir thank you uh, dr vijay for uh, exhaustively covering this topics on uh, tcd and neuro imaging specifically intracranial stenosis and vasospasm Uh, so sir if uh, you both permit i'll like to take a few questions from the audience oh yes yes so uh, so sir uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, we are going to have questions now uh, in general about all the four topics although uh, let me start with uh, some questions specifically on uh, related to this last topic so dr vijay can address them so the first question is by dr maria teresa from the philippines uh, she practices at the chongua hospital and uh, the question is uh, are there any tables of normal values and uh, which table of values of abnormal stenosis do you recommend we use okay so so the there are definite tables uh, you know the the two slides which i showed you know for the book which we just published Uh, if she is from philippines uh, so, so you know we were two editors uh, uh, joy navarro was one of the editors with me uh, so we have given we have tried to concentrate it more towards the asian you know asian criteria uh, that provides you the normal uh, flow velocities uh, the second one is that you can have alexandros andre alexandros book and you can get the normal uh, you know flow velocity criteria for different ages from there but what i told you is that you know your patient population is different than what andre alexandros population was my patient population is different than your population so it's always good that you develop your own criteria use any criteria whichever you can get from any book uh, whether you are getting it on the basis of one of the papers from lawrence baum and takes systolic uh, you know peak systolic velocity criteria or you take from my publications or andre's publications on the basis of mean flow velocity and just test it in in your population which one works best and then keep using that one so you have to you have to definitely develop your criteria there is no way that you can blindly follow somebody's criteria it does not work uh, because then you will be struggling that because this is a real life situation you think like this i told you more than 80 is equal to 50% dystonosis but if somebody is having the mean flow velocity of 81 or 79 you know the, so so we say this is something like this when you are doing the test patient velocity was 75 but because of you know some anxiety or something this patient started holding breath so 75 became 85 and then you unnecessary diagnose it it's it's a stenosis other patient becomes anxious and the velocity was 100 but because of hyperventilation the velocity dropped to 60 and you unnecessarily miss this patient so be careful do it and just develop your own criteria and i told you you need to do only 10 patients 10 patients you diagnose do ct angiogram 10 patients let ct angiogram diagnose it you bring to your tc lab knowing the diagnosis and just talk to your hospital that i want to do 10 patients free that we will not charge them for doing a tcd because we are developing the criteria and then after that you will be so confident that in my population this is a wonderful thing and then be careful if you are doing it for females because some of them are anemic anemia increases flow velocities uh you know especially on females if you are doing it during the menstrual cycle because of hormones the velocity may be sky high if somebody has taken a coffee the velocity may increase so all these are minor minor things which may change so just be careful about those things and then it becomes a very very reliable tool sir i think you you raised a very interesting point on the hemorrheology while considering uh, the velocities 
uh, while performing the test. So, uh, are there any other conditions which could affect the hemorrhagology and ultimately the velocity on the TCD? So, so the 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 only things which change. So, like anemia, uh, you know, hyperthyroidism. Uh, these two are the flows which are called as hyperdynamic circulations. They will always present with higher velocities. Very young age, females, they can have higher velocities. But then they will be generally elevated. But when you are doing the test, you may find sometimes, uh, you know, sudden fluctuations in velocities, which occur because of mainly anxiety and hyperventilation. So anxiety leads to hyperventilation. Hyperventilation leads to vasoconstriction. And vasoconstriction drops the velocities. So you just because patient is in front of you, you can always say, fine, this patient is, oh, is hyperventilating. Let me calm the patient down and then I do it after that. But be careful about if they are generally elevated, all arteries elevated, then look for this anemia and thyrotoxicosis. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, the next question is for Dr. Arvind Sharma. Uh, the question is by Dr. Faith Rosario from Philippines Chil Children's Medical Center. And uh, a very interesting procedural question that uh, does uh, the waveforms differ if the patient is sedated? And before you answer that question, sir, my, I, I would like to add another uh, point to this, that should patients ever be sedated while performing TCD? No. For performing a TCD, see, uh, I tell you the difference, what we are experiencing. When we are doing for the sickle cell uh, children, uh, we found that uh, they, they are of a very younger age and the, the, to identify vessel is very easy. But to keep a children in the same position or four years or three years, they, they move their head up very fast, right? So the art which was Dr. Vijay was explaining, right, to hold the head by your own probe, the way you do it is very important. So there is maximum time, most of the time there is no need of any sedation. And when you have a patient of stroke in the hospital, right, when you can do an MRI and you can do a CT, you can do TCD without sedation. So sedation is out, no need of sedation for the patient in TCD. And coming to the point that um, sedation causing the effect, as we were discussing in the sickle cell and as Dr. Vijay told about the, all the mechanisms, right? So velocities are dependent on more on those factors. Sedation, I don't think have any effect on the velocities. Dr. Vijay will add to it if, if I am not correct, right? So that can affect the basal metabolism, what is affected, right? But the velocities of the brain are auto-regulated, so that doesn't affect. So sedation, sedation, as sedation, if you are doing a normal kind of sedation, it has no effect on the velocities. But if you sedate a patient so much that the patient's bad. respiratory center gets suppressed, oh, then, then the carbon dioxide starts accumulating, flow yeah. velocities go up. Absolutely. It, it is cruel to do a sedation for doing a TCD. So <laughs> best, best, way, best way is play with the patient. Absolutely. You play with the patient, yeah. switch on the machine, switch on the machine, Give the probe to the child. Every time he is going to touch or move the hand in front of the probe, machine will make a musical sound. And he starts thinking it's a toy. And then he will permit you. But what happens is most of the children, they start crying. And children's crying is not the same as adults crying. Absolutely. Many children, when they are crying, they hold breath. Absolutely. And after that, they develop, you know, this... <laughs> Like this kind yeah, of sound. Speaking. So this works as classical hyperventilation. So if your child is crying, don't be in a rush. Tell the mother, take the child outside. Let the child become normal, bring them, bring him back again. So but you have to play with the child. So that is the irony which happened with us when we were doing for the children, right? So we want them to be calm. So we do the TCD. They don't cry. They don't shout. Because if you are there, they are, they are crying. The velocity, the TCD also changes there. And as Dr. Vijay told, it's the hyperventilation. So the, the, the question who has asked is from the pediatric hospital. She knows that, right? So it took so much of time more doing, doing the children's where the, you can see the vessel just putting the probe. So that's true. No doubt in that. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
you have to keep the patient calm yeah but but very appropriate question from from the pediatrics Absolutely. point of view Absolutely. and i think Fantastic. very well answered Fantastic question. Yeah, appreciate just it. You know, uh, just understand that uh, there is no treatment in this world which is better than giving blood to a patient with sickle cell anemia at an appropriate time. If you if you use TCD by stop criteria and you give blood when the patient's mean flow velocity in MCA reaches more than two hundred, uh, the TAM velocity more than two hundred. and you give blood at that time so what happens is you can prevent the strokes 92% 92% of strokes can be prevented now if you keep giving blood on the basis of hemoglobin numbers then your patient is going to receive extra blood he is going to develop hemochromatosis and he is going to have a heart failure and other problems because of extra blood so not only doing by tcd it saves the blood it saves complications related to over blood transfusion and also 92 is almost equal to 100 so that means you can certainly say with guarantee that if the sickle cell anemia patient comes to my clinic and i have got a tcd machine there will be a rare occurrence that one child will develop a stroke who is under my follow up you can say with guarantee so it it is a very pleasant thing i will share with uh, dr sanjay sharma who is at chatisgarh uh one of the uh, eastern part of the state where the sickle cell is common he told the pediatrician was so happy that went to stop the transfusion for such kids right when we did the velocities for them and the five of those kids are doing good in chatisgarh and one of the pediatrician wrote to him about it so this is how you make a difference by doing it thank you sir so and before we take the next question from the audience i i found an interesting paper on uh, sickle cell disease really in relation to tcd which said that the peak systolic velocity is an ideal parameter to screen sickle cell disease uh, in patients and as we know that uh, sickle cell disease is not properly diagnosed in the regions that we uh, reside in as well as the audience of this workshop resides in what are your comments about that Dr. Vijay, so, so it is like this. See, these are velocities. These are patients' own velocities. Peak systolic velocity is a component of mean flow velocity or component of TAM. It's not something separate. So what happens is that uh, you know various types of machines are existing in the world. There are some good quality machines. There are some bad quality machines. There are some good operators, some bad operators. So what happens is. that many times people don't feel comfortable in calculating the tam but peak systolic velocity is well, just a peak there it's so easily visible many people use peak systolic velocity so there is no problem if you are more comfortable with peak systolic velocity there are studies which have used only peak systolic velocity certainly nobody wants to use end diastolic velocity for children if you talk to about adults to me then i say you know i feel end diastolic velocity is much more reliable as compared to peak systolic but in children for sickle cell anemia if you want to use only peak systolic velocity then just devise your own method that fine this is what i am going to use so peak systolic velocity is roughly about 20 or 25% higher than tam velocity that's all it doesn't make much difference because we are not talking about absolute flow velocity we are talking about monitoring we are talking about longitudinal pattern temporal pattern so you are saying this is a child which i i started seeing in the month of july when the child comes back in the month of october i do again and then i i'm comparing his test from july i'm not saying that september october test is a, a fresh test so whether you are you want to use peak systolic velocity we are fine with it thank you sir thank you for addressing that uh, our next question is by dr maria socorro sarfati from baguio general hospital philippines and uh, dr sarfati wants to know what is your experience of tcd on reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome okay so the reversible vasoconstriction syndrome if you want to simplify it this is a kind of stenosis which develops kind of vasculopathy which develops in special situations it behaves exactly like stenosis or like vasculitis 
right so this is a very good tool for diagnosing but more than diagnosis because once you do the first one you cannot say with certainty that are you dealing with a patient with pre existing stenosis or are you dealing with a patient who was previously normal and now has developed cerebral vasoconstriction but it is a wonderful tool when you monitor this patient either daily alternate day once in a week and then you say fine this is the time when this cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome has gone away or is it still evolving so this is where it helps definitely it's helpful it 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 prepares your patient that patient is going into a wrong direction or patient is going into a right direction thank you sir thank you i think uh, we have addressed uh, most of the questions by the audience and uh, i am happy to share uh, with our course coordinators that we had close to 250 people logging in live for this session so it's it's a good we have seen a good amount of excitement for this workshop uh, to the audience i would specifically uh, ask to fill out a survey form to to share with us about your experience of how about how you feel about tcd after this workshop it's a very interesting questionnaire that we have uh, uploaded on the website please go to the survey link and fill it up uh, also view the resources uh, tab where we have published articles on tcd uh, specifically you will find links about uh, papers published on tcd by dr vijay sharma and dr arvind sharma our Uh, resource persons for this event and yes please do not forget to uh, visit the partner booths to uh, see what zydes is doing in your respective country uh, with that i would like to uh, now Hardik, propose uh, Hardik, yes Hardik, one, Hardik, i have you know i have left my email and get arvin's email also to them if they want if they have any any burning questions or when the covid 19 you know absolutely if they wish to come you know they, they can just write and i can just accept them there is no problem at all or 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 arvind can accept yeah, to, to his center yeah absolutely absolutely yeah, in fact in fact uh, if we have any more questions we will directly share those questions with you and uh, so that you can provide the answers and then we will share back those answers with uh, the audience so we would be happy to do that uh, for the audience and uh, so with this we come towards the end of uh, this uh, session and i would like to propose a vote of thanks uh, specifically i would like to begin with uh, dr arvind sharma who has been uh, a point of great support to us in fact he was the one who uh, who uh, touched base with dr vijay sharma to be a course coordinator with for this workshop and so from the bottom of our hearts we thank you for helping us out to arrange this workshop on transcranial doppler also a big thank you to dr vijay sharma for taking this time i know it's a late hour for you sir but uh, your session has been very very engaging and i i'm sure you also feel the same by the kind of questions that the audience have put up uh, dr arvind sharma from your team dr mamta has been a support in arranging the videos of the uh, live patients so many thanks to her as well and i would also like to thank our local teams for coordinating this event and um, uh, making it a success and above all a uh, big thank you to the audience for attending this workshop posing your question then making it a big success so thank you very much uh, be safe from any covid related concerns and we hope to see you again soon please fill out the survey uh, and we look forward to meeting you again in a similar forum very soon uh, as you can see on your screens a recorded version of this workshop will be available on the same link for two weeks starting tomorrow so in case you want to revisit some points or if you want your colleagues to uh, have an understanding about tcd please ask them to register and view this uh, video and with that we come to an end of this session hardik. thank you very much yeah thank you hardik this link they can share with the other people also they can register and absolutely so that is very important absolutely so the link which we have can be revisited for all the 3 hours talk and the discussion which happened so Completely. this is very important and thank you very much uh, that we started neurospace with a great note thank you hardik thank you thank you thank you sir okay.
Thank you, Dr. Vijay Sharma. It was a pleasure having you. Vijay, from our as a host, we really thank you from the bottom of heart that you give a wonderful um, experience to us, and we keep uh, uh, taking your esteemed services and honourable services, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good Have night. a great evening. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night, Shank. Thank you. Yeah. Good night, Shank. Yeah. 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 Okay.